What up, guys? It's Bones. So, um, I have been joking about starting a YouTube channel where I just rant about things that I really like or I really hate for a really long time. Um, and the live-action Avatar 2024 finally did it. I finally was like, no. No, I have to do this. I'm going to talk about this for a really long time. Um, because I have a lot of opinions, and quite honestly, my family is sick of hearing them, so... I'm instead going to write them all out, record them, and put them on the internet for people who will either love or hate them, you know? Do what you will. Um, so yeah, this is my needlessly thorough tirade against Avatar The Last Airbender live action 2024. So I might have a more reactionary type video to this um, and everything right and wrong with it, mostly wrong, spoiler alert on the YouTube channel Stellacore because my sister Red is right there with me in hating almost everything they do with this series. Um, and if we do, it'll just be us losing our minds over and over for like an hour about how annoying everything is. So if that sounds more fun than me being articulate, um, as articulate as I can be, then maybe you should check that out. But anyway, this video is going to be pretty structured. Uh, instead of following the timeline and reacting as things happen, I'm going to be explaining things um, in hopefully a more clear way instead of just shrieking at the camera for an hour. So before I get into anything specific, I want to clarify that if you liked the live action adaptation, I am not condemning you. I do think you are not watching it with a critical eye, but I also think that that's overrated. You do not have to watch things with a critical eye to, you know, enjoy media. Enjoy it. I'm, I love that for you. I can't because I, my brain won't stop going. And I love that for you. If you can just sit down and be like, this was fun. Great. Um, another thing I like to, I'd like to clarify is that a lot of my problems initially can be dismissed as, uh, well, they just don't like adaptations. They wanted everything to be the same as the cartoon. And I want to clarify, I did not come into this expecting everything to be exactly the same. Uh, Red has a rule about adaptations. You can change the big things, but not the little details. And I love this description, and I'm gonna explain it a bit. I watched the live action because I love the world, and because I love the characters in it. The plot was obviously great, but I would love to see new plot points or old ones done in different ways. Um, as long as it's done well, like, I don't care if you change the plot or if you change, like, different things up to make it more interesting. But who the characters are and the world that they live in, what makes it different from any other fantasy I've read, those are the little details that you cannot change. Or else I'm not watching an adaptation of Avatar The Last Airbender, I'm watching an entirely different show that you just slap the characters' names onto for clout. The plot and different occurrences are the big details. You can change those up, make it interesting for me, as long as the characters I know and love still act like the characters I know and love in those new situations. The sections that I'm talking about, there will be four, will be world building, which concerns the things that define the entire Avatar universe rather than specific people or cultures. Two, characters, in which I'll go through pretty much everyone in order that they appear on screen. I have less notes about some. Uh, three, overarching themes, which refer to the causes of consistent changes throughout the story, and four, episode choices, in which I'll mention plot choices in specific episodes and how they affected the story. To the first section, world building. So the first question we have to ask is, what makes the Avatar world as a whole unique? First of all, obviously the bending. And I will say, they did a pretty great job with the bending in this. I'll admit it. The previous live action, which shall not be named, set a really low bar, but even without that consideration, I really did enjoy the bending in this. Um, although I don't know martial arts, so I can't attest to this myself, I have heard people say that some of the bending forms were like three-fourth bending form and then random punches following. Um, but, like, it looked really good to me, and I don't know martial arts, so if anyone knows, then, and knows martial arts, feel free to, like, tell me if that's actually true, or if it was just people looking for things to hate, which, 
I don't think you need to look in this too hard. So like, you know, you don't have to make up things to hate in this show. I found plenty of them and I, I double checked. I fact checked myself. Um, anyway, the only real problem I had with the vend bending was one little thing about airbending. They made Aang able to just like fly around without his glider with just precision wind around him that didn't disrupt anything or anything like he didn't have to be close to the ground. Like there were no caveats and could just like float and just fly anywhere he wanted without inconvenience. Um, which is a nitpick. I, I don't expect everyone to have a problem with it. And it really wasn't one of the main problems I had with the series. It's just something that I felt diminishes the importance, especially of the glider. Um, because in the original cartoon, the glider is a super important piece, not only of Aang's like, mobility, his ability to go places, but his heritage. Um, so it's, it's really important to him in a lot of different ways. And this culminates in season three when the glider is broken and Aang decides to give it up so that he can remain in anonymity. Um, but the live action reduces the importance to the, of the glider to negligence, just like it does nearly everything else. Also, when he escapes from Zuko's ship, they have him jump off with his glider, but then Zuko hits the glider with a fireball and Aang falls. And he just, he just falls. Like he can't float. Like he can't fly like they already showed me he could do anytime, anywhere, without having to wind up for it or having ground nearby or anything. He falls just so we can have the drama of him falling until Sokka reaches out and catches him. Which is unnecessary because y'all literally told me that he could fly earlier this episode. So instead of being concerned for Aang during this falling sequence, I was just confused as to why he was not flying instead. Like, if you want to make him fly, I guess, sure. But, like, the same episode, you make him fly. It was weird. Anyway, um, I also have one problem with the fake airbending. Uh, so airbenders can use their gliders anywhere, obviously, because they can manipulate the wind. Um, but in this case, they have Teo and his dad in Omashu, which is not an air temple. It does not have air currents. It does not have the steep drop for a takeoff point. And in Teo... As someone who can't manipulate the air currents himself should not be able to fly there. Which again isn't a deal breaker, but it is kind of disrespectful to the thought they originally put into the mechanics of it and the reasons behind it. Not a deal breaker, but an omen of things to come. Anyway, the actual bending, as I said, was pretty rad, no complaints from me. Uh, so you might be asking yourself, what else could you mean by world building? For me, there's one other thing that really makes the Avatar world weird and wacky, and that's the inclusion of combo animals. Uh, it's acknowledged in universe in, and in the cartoon as well when they find it, that the king of Ba Sing Se has a bear. Just a bear. Not a platypus bear or any other sort of combination. Just a bear. This is so jarring to the characters in universe that people pay exorbitant prices to sit next to the just a bear. The main cast can't even wrap their like brain around the concept. And I'm going to be honest, so right after I finished the series and I was ang angrily ranting about things in my head and I started writing this tirade, I had a whole long section about how the writers of the live action removed combo animals and their original dialogue and were only using the combo animals that we see that are explicitly part of world building like the badger moles and the ostrich horses, right? Well, I rewatched it while I was writing this to make sure I had my facts right, because if I'm going to completely destroy something, then I want it to be true to what actually happened, obviously. And it turns out that this accusation is actually unfair, generally. But it does raise another problem. On rewatch, when I was listening, I realized that they did, in fact, come up with a lot of original combo animals that weren't in the original series, and they threw those into the dialogue, so point in their favor. But after I'd watched it the first time, I didn't remember that. Because honestly, when the writing is good, you don't notice until the writing is bad, you know? Um, after my first watch through, all I remembered was that Sokka and Katara for, were from the Wolf Village, and that Sokka, at one point, says that Momo probably tastes like... Chicken. Just chicken. To be honest, my hackles were up immediately when I saw that it was just the wolf tribe, but I was willing to let it go because I could imagine some lore in which non-combo animals were spiritual 
occurrences or spirit tales, like Heibai is a panda, just a panda, and the moon and the ocean are simple koi fish, and Wanchi Tong is an owl-ish, some hellspawn owl, um, and all of his knowledge seekers are foxes. So I was willing to be like, yeah, okay, they can be the wolf tribe because it's a spiritual mythical creature, like having your house crest be a dragon or a unicorn in our world, right? Um, I, but I shouldn't have to invent lore in my head to make your adaptation make sense, but it wasn't that much of a stretch, so, so I'll let it go. But then at the end of the first episode or the beginning of the second, somewhere around there, Sokka makes that comment about Momo tasting like chicken, and I am unreasonably angry about it because it would have been so easy to fix. There's a, literally a line in the original. I believe one of the swamp benders says, they bet Appa will taste like possum chicken. They could have taken that line directly from the cartoon, and it would have been fine. The thing is that these are the only two instances of them messing up, but they're the only times I remembered, because if something takes you out of the fantasy world that has been established, it's going to jar you and stick with you more than the times that they didn't do that, obviously. Um, and the annoying thing is that it would have been so easy to fix. You don't have to CGI a whole new creature for either of these instances. You literally just have to add one word to your dialogue. It's just another thing that makes the entire script of this series feel like an unedited first draft. And like, if one person, if just one person had looked at it with a critical eye, it could have been fixed. And yet somehow it made it all the way to production without a single person being like, chickens don't exist in this universe. They don't. Possum chickens exist. Plenty of other types of chickens exist, but not chickens. That's it. One word. And again, if everything else was good, this wouldn't be a deal breaker. But it's really just an indication of how they're about to treat the rest of the script and the story in general. Like consistency is optional, and the spirit of the series can come and go as it pleases. Those were all my world things. Uh, we'll get into more specifics later. Uh, so let's let's move on to the next section. Characters. Okay, I'm gonna start this um, with kind of a disclaimer. I'm going to say some things that might reflect badly on how the actors are acting, but I do not mean that to be a judgment on their skill or them as people. Um, the writers and directors of the series were horrendous. I do mean that to be a judgment on their skill. And maybe these actors were good, but were given really bad stage directions. I don't know. It is not my place to know whether the fault lies with the actor or the director and the writer. I'm just going to tell you what happened, and unfortunately, the actors are the ones who did it, so I don't know if the horrible conveying of emotion is because they're bad or because they were told to say their lines like that. So yeah. Disclaimer, like, don't... Don't razz on the, on the people acting for this, because I, heck if I know if it's their fault or if it's the writing, because the writing was horrible and the directing was obviously horrible, so I cannot blame the actors for how they acted. Okay, first person we see that is named. Obviously, I'm, I'm only doing the people we, like, actually met in the series. Like, I'm not going to do random people that they created. Which I know there weren't many. But anyway, Gyatso. Um, I actually think Gyatso was one of the mold, more developed characters, which is kind of a problem, if you think about it. But... Uh, that's for later. He he was really true to what little we saw of him in the OG cartoon. Uh, they overused him to the detriment of the story and the relationships between other characters. Um, but I will mention that in those characters' parts, not here. So, in one of the only positive parts of this review, Gyatso was pretty good. <sighs> and then we're on to the main characters. Guys, these guys, there's so much to say, and I'm I'm already tired. I haven't even started, and I don't... Oh, man. Okay. Aang. <laughs> Ken and Aang is a really complicated character because he is 12 years old, and he acts like a 12-year-old, and he thinks like a 12-year-old, but he also has the power of God and anime on his side, and a destiny that weighs down on him in a tragic past, and is the only remaining person of his people and is also completely displaced in time. But the really important thing is that despite all the tragedy and high expectations placed upon him, Aang remains a child. He has childish desires and thoughts, and he keeps his optimism. 
this Aang is lacking pretty much all of those traits. Um, first of all, that monologue he gives to Appa before running away wasn't incorrect in technicality, because everything he said was correct, but the fact that he articulated it like that was just insane. Um, no 12-year-old talks like that, and no person is that self-aware, especially at that age. Like, why did they have Aang monologue dramatically to Appa about how he's just a kid who wants to have fun instead of actually showing him be a kid who wants to have fun. Literally him like weirdly watching the children play at the South Pole instead of going and like playing with them was, it was so weird. That was a horrible, weird choice. If you want me to believe that Aang wants to play with children and then you just have him stare at them from a really far way away, that's weird. This is a problem because they took out pretty much every single part of Aang that was childish. He's not detouring to see animals, he's not even interested in learning bending, for fun or for the Avatar stuff. Uh, at the end of the first episode, he gives one of those really horribly written speeches and explicitly says that in order to not let the airbenders die in vain, he's going to be the Avatar they deserved, and lists learning the other elements as part of that, which is another example of the writers don't know how to show and not tell, because this whole season was the Book of Water, right? Aang is supposed to le be learning to bend water. That's the whole point. But he bends water, count it, zero times. None. After that whole speech he gives about not letting Gyatso die in vain, he still doesn't do it. Katara literally invites him to bend with her, and he refuses multiple times. But Bones, he does the whole ocean thing against the Fire Nation fleet. No, he does not. The ocean spirit does that. The closest Aang ever gets to waterbending is giving Katara some advice on her waterbending as a sort of master of one element to learner of another. Which is fine, because he is a master, he should be able to give that kind of advice. Except it's the only thing he does. Aang is supposed to be this bright-eyed, bushy-tailed kiddo who's thrilled to travel the world and learn all he can about bending and people, and he isn't. On top of that, he's just not cheerful or playful at all. Like, this kid, this Aang, is the most serious, like, stone-faced, like... I don't think this, this child has ever had fun once in his life. He literally talks to Ko face to face, and I think that they took out the whole showing emotion, steal your face thing. Um, but if they didn't, then it wouldn't have been a problem, because I never saw this actor make any sort of face. So, he would have been safe from Ko in the first place. Yeah, he's just not, not, not very kind, like, in general. For example, like, in, in the first episode, and in the first episode of the cartoon, we can s compare these two th instances. Um, Sokka doesn't know what a sky bison is, and Aang is like, sky bison, you know? Obviously it's a sky bison. And in the cartoon it sounds like, you know, like, come on man, a sky bison. Everyone knows what a sky bison is. In the live action, he's like, sky bison. Sky bison. Six legs, horns, brown arrows, sky bison. Sky bison! Is like the most aggro thing in the world. Like, like, he is going to bite Sokka's head off for not knowing what a sky bison is. And it's, it's the weird choice and it's a horrible choice. Um, they also made a couple of changes to his backstory that completely change Aang's character. Um, which could have been interesting if they were handled well. And they weren't. Um, so first of all, they removed the scene of the kids shunning him for being the Avatar and replaced it with the idea that they'd always been terrified of him because he didn't have great control, but he had like a lot of power, uh, which completely changes him as a character. And I wonder if they did this because they got rid of Zhang Zhang and the fire incident. Um, but Aang being scared of all bending at least does explain why he doesn't want to learn any bending. Except if that was the reason that he didn't want to learn any bending, then they should have, like, actually done something with that.
And also, um, the fact that before the Air Temple was attacked, instead of him running away from home, he was going for a flight to clear his head and then coming straight back. Um, it completely changes his motivations. Cannon Aang deliberately decided to ditch his duties and left the Air Nomads to die. Or rather, he feels like he abandoned them to death, even though there was no way he could possibly have known. We're not blaming Aang for that, but... This Aang intended to come back, which of course does not erase the survival's guilt he must feel about it, but it makes it feel a lot less horrible that he left in the first place, because he wasn't intending to abandon his duties at all, he was just going to clear his head. Um, it softens the tragedy of it all, and weakens the narrative and character arc that Aang goes through over the series, of Aang going from someone who runs away from his problems to someone who stands his ground and faces them. Anyway, there's a lot more I could talk about, but I don't want to. Um, suffice it to say that this Aang was basically Aang when Appa had been stolen by the Sandbenders, but before he realized that there was still meaning in this world by helping that family get through the Serpent's Pass. That, that little slice of Aang when he's super depressed and angry at everyone in the world, that's who this Aang was the entire time. Uh, he's bitter, he's serious, and the writers are so intent on presenting him as the Avatar that they've forgotten that the Avatar isn't a character. It's a title. And Aang should have a character separate from it. All right. Katara. There is simultaneously so much to say about Katara and absolutely nothing at all. Because that's what the writers did with her. Nothing. They gutted her. Because Katara is a very complex character, but when you boil it down, in the original, she has two modes. Team Mom, and endless font of incandescent rage. I think they still tried to make her Team Mom, but there was no action behind it, um, as you'll see. She spoke about love and family, and all of that constantly, but when it came down to it, they replaced all of her emotional mother motherly scenes with Aang. Instead of Katara acting as comforter for him, they replaced her with his father figure, Gyatso. For example, in the Air Temple, when he flips out, instead of Katara t talking Aang down, he has a ton of flashbacks about Gyatso, which, by the way, should not have helped in this situation, because he's freaking out that Gyatso is dead, so I feel like having flashbacks about the guy that you're freaking out is dead, like, it it's not gonna help you, he's not going- whatever. But anyway, that somehow helped Aang, and Gyatso helped him calm down from the Avatar state, not Katara. Um, and Gyatso was also the one to tell Aang that he's not responsible for what happened in the temple, instead of a storm-like episode where Aang confesses he left and, and Katara asserts it. Um, and also in the end, they want me to believe that Katara's words about family reached Aang, and that's why he returned from being possessed by law. Except they had explained that Law wouldn't let Aang go until he found Tui. We have this extended sequence of Katara speaking, trying to reach Aang and clearly having no reaction from him. And then, coincidentally near the end of her speech, Yue sacrifices herself. Tui returns to the sky. We have Law turn and look at Tui and then let Aang go. Katara did not talk him down. Law just decided to dip because Twi came back. So yeah, not Team Mom in this. Everything that Katara was purported to have done, erased. Um, on to Rage. Katara's Rage is a huge part of her character. Um, she's her own yin and yang, push and pull. She's warring between her genuine love and care for people and the hatred that festers in her because of the injustices of the world. Her bending in the cartoon is largely connected to her emotions, especially before she becomes a true master. Her bending strength increases exponentially when she's pissed, which helps them in a lot of situations. The clearest example I can think of in the live action of this removal is with Jet. In the cartoon, she's horrified at what he's done, to the point that when they run into each other the next season, she flies into a rage and tries to end him on sight. In this, the episode after Katara figures out that Jet has literally been blowing up random Earth King civilians, when she and Sokka are wandering around the cave of two lovers, Sokka makes a comment about Jet or something, and Katara defends this terrorist, saying that he helped her with her bending. 
One of Katara's biggest faults in this series is that she's often blinded by her own rage. Once she feels you've gone too far, it's almost impossible to get her to forgive you. And not only that, but she retroactively erases any positive feelings she ever had about you and forgets anything that may have been a redeeming character trait. Um, we see this with Jet, who only receives any modicum of forgiveness with his literal death, and with Hakoda, who Katara manages not to forgive for months for leaving even when they're trapped on a tiny boat together. And with Zuko, of course, who she punishes for his past long after all the others have begun warming up to him. So, they've removed Katara's most admirable quality of motherly love and caring, and her worst quality of holding grudges like she's got a title to defend, and left her nothing but a sobbing pile of feelings. So yeah, horrible canon Katara, um, but the Ember Island players would be thrilled to know this follows their character notes so closely. All right, Sokka. You know that one episode in the cartoon when Sokka gets stuck in a hole and he's like, I'll give up sarcasm in me. That's really all I got. I'm nothing without that, but I'll give it up. Well, I don't know what he traded them for in this, but uh, I guess he never fell humorously into a hole, so... And okay, fine, he's sarcastic, but he's not funny, like cartoon Sokka. He's got the sarcasm, but that's his literal only form of humor, which takes a really funny character and just kind of makes him a jerk. Because his constant sarcasm isn't softened by the fact that he's also always constantly making a fool of himself with silly jokes. He's just being mean to other people all the time. What else do we have as Sokka's notable features? Boomerang. He is a boomerang guy. There's a whole plot line about boomerang always coming back. One episode he loses it and someone calls him ponytail guy and Sokka is so depressed about not being boomerang guy. Where is boomerang? Oh, he holds it. Did you ever see him throw it? Did he ever throw it like a boomerang instead of like a throwing axe? The answer is yes, actually. I really thought he never did, but like I said, I rewatched this so my critiques would be accurate, and I nearly missed it. I had to rewind and watch like three times to make sure I was right. But one time, at the beginning of episode five, Sokka throws his boomerang, and it comes back to him while we cut away. I hope you understand that the fact that I was so overjoyed at one actual boomeranging is just a nail in the coffin on this show because Sokka's signature weapon should not be so rare. Um, in fact, we see Suki use her fan like a boomerang before Sokka uses his like one. He's just like hucking those suckers at coconuts like a bowie knife. It's nonsense. Let's see other things. He makes two jokes that aren't sarcasm comments on meat three times, throws his boomerang three times, and only one of those, as I said, does it act like a boomerang. They have removed all of Sokka's defining traits, except for his wolf tail and his sarcasm, which really makes this Sokka read like just a jerk. Not to mention the removal of the sexes mark, but I will, I will get to that. I will talk about that later. Um, but that's that's actually mostly surface level, and they did Sokka dirty in deeper ways than that as well. Sokka's real role in the group, as much as he wanted it to be war in the beating, is the tactician. He's the smart one, and he's also the one with the best instincts. They can be wrong, of course, um, there are plenty of jokes about it, but when it comes down to it, Sokka can trust his gut, and he can trust his brain. He's prone to overanalyzing, though, and that's one downfall of being such a clever cookie. This Sokka just isn't. They undermine Sokka's intelligence and instincts even when he really should be correct, such as in the Cave of Two Lovers, when he figured out the crystals, that they retconned into being badger moles, guiding people just so Katara could sob about love, like the Ember Island players always wanted to see on the big screen. I'm gonna be bringing that up a lot. Um, one of the most egregious examples, though, of overanalyzing in the original cartoon were his assumptions and fears about his how his dad perceives him. Um, but in this, they make Hakoda canon disappointed in him, going as far to ex as to explicitly say that Sokka should not be in charge of people's safety. So we don't see that Sokka is very smart and that has its setbacks. We see that Sokka is 
a random dude with some mechanical proclivities who knows exactly what he's told. And that's disappointing, honestly. All right, Zuko. Before I get into the character of Zuko, because they did my boy real dirty, um, I want to clarify that I actually adore this actor. I think he's doing a fantastic job, and he's adorable, and all the characters were screwed by the writing, and I can't say for most of them that the acting didn't play a part in that, but this boy, this boy is doing the most. There's one part I'm obsessed with during the Powhai Stronghold Rescue where Zuko decides to threaten Aang so they can both escape, and in the cartoon he just freezes a moment before doing it. But in the live action, you can see Zuko's thought process here as he figures out a way to get them out, even though he's literally wearing a mask that covers his entire face. It's adorable. I love this boy. Stan him. Love him. Okay, Zuko part two, they murdered my boy. First off, appearance. <laughs> the actor looks fine. As stated, he's doing great. Keep it up, darling. But there seems to be a little smudge on his face. Maybe like a trick of the light? Like, come over here, darling. I can wipe that off with a moist towel. Oh! Oh, that's supposed to be the scar. Like, I, I hate to say it, but the scar is the first thing I should notice about Prince Zuko. It should look absolutely like a fully grown man tried and succeeded in burning off half a child, like half a child's face. He should have only one eyebrow and his scarred eye should be forced somewhat close because the skin around it just doesn't work like it used to. Half the time, this scar looks like a trick of the light. It's not nearly bad enough, and I'm kind of mad that we don't get some rep for, like, a scarred character that we all agree is beautiful and lovely and proud. It just looks like he's got a port wine stain on his face instead, and, and that's honestly a tragedy. As for the written characterization, um, they lost me with one line in the first episode. Uh, so what happens, right, is they're outside the Southern Water Tribe, and Sokka demands Zuko fight him one-on-one -on -one instead of them raising the village, and Lieutenant G initially stops Zuko from accepting, saying they can easily take what they want by force, and Zuko looks at him and says, Well, where's the glory in that? Where's the glory? The glory. Zuko doesn't fight for glory. He fights for honor. This is so important to his character, and it's what sets him apart from the rest of his family and a large part of the Fire Nation as a whole. Instead of being concerned with his own accomplishments, he's endeavoring to uphold his and his nation's honor, and he's fighting to subjugate the world because he really believes that it would be best for them, not because he wants to be known as the person who did it. For instance, Canon Zhao wants to go down as Zhao the Moonslayer, a personal accomplishment linked to his name specifically. Whenever Canon Zuko talks about what he wants, he talks about the Fire Nation as a whole, wanting to spread the glory of his nation, and for people to understand that his people are good. He isn't fighting for personal glory. He's fighting for honor, specifically that of his nation as its prince. Anyway, this would have been so easy to fix, because if he had said, where's the honor in that, it would have highlighted Zuko's commitment to fair play and his personal moral standards that the Fire Nation military at large does not share. Um, and instead, they have him say glory. And in doing so, Zuko embodies every single horrible ideal of a Fire Nation soldier that the Water Tribe has ever feared. Not a kid like them, just trying to do what he thinks he needs to, desperately clinging to his own standards and ideals even when they seem at odds with what he's been taught is right. And then the fight that follows. Zuko is competent. He always has been. But it's important that since the beginning of the cartoon, they also show that he's just a kid like the rest of them. In fact, they took out the exchange where Zuko says, but you're just a kid, to Aang, showing not only his surprise at the Avatar being not being over a hundred, but also a moment of reluctance to think that a child like Aang could be a threat to the Fire Nation. Reluctance to hurt a 12-year-old child. And of course they took out Aang's response, and you're just a teenager, which again establishes right away that Zuko is not just another faceless Fire Nation monster. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, here, Zuko takes Sokka down, no problem. 
which happened in the cartoon. But the difference is that in the cartoon, Sokka totally chumped Zuko with his boomerang. This establishes right away that Zuko is not the infallible, unstoppable Fire Nation machine that Katara and Sokka fear. He's human, and he can be chumped. And in the cartoon, Zuko is flustered by this, of course. He's pissy about it, because that's season one Zuko's base character trait. But he doesn't try to harm Sokka unnecessarily for it, which is so important, because Zuko doesn't want to hurt anyone. He avoids it when possible, even when that person hurt him. And that's another thing that sets him apart from everyone's idea of a Fire Nation soldier. But in the live action, Zuko takes Sokka down without a problem. And when Sokka has been soundly beaten and didn't even get one hit in retaliation, Zuko tries to burn a fallen opponent who has never been a threat to him. This same type of slight against his character happens on Kyoshi in the next episode. Aang is meditating, and Zuko is willing to go through Katara to get him. This is totally fine, absolutely in character. But then he bends fire at her, and Katara, who can't bend very well right now, of course, falls back and simply cowers from him because she's understandably afraid of being burned. Now here's the problem. Instead of power walking past her with single-minded determination as Zuko would, he instead towers over her fallen form, says a line about taking out anyone who would stand between him and his goal, and prepares to burn her. Even though she isn't standing between him and Aang anymore, she's literally cowering, hoping he'll let her live. A key part of Zuko's redemption arc in canon works because, for him, it was really just business. He never did anything that wasn't necessary or that he thought was, ne was necessary for his direct goal, like hurting Sokka and Katara. Because Zuko's never wanted to hurt anyone. He doesn't want to hurt the Avatar. In a perfect world, he would capture him peaceably and leave it at that. Zuko wouldn't even burn Zhao in canon. And not only were they in an Agni Kai, in which, you know, death is kind of expected and burns are even more so, Zhao would have deserved it for being a freak. A freaky creep, man. He's the worst. Um, but here's another example of instead of acting like Zuko, the writers are having Zuko act like Katara's worst fear of a Fire Nation soldier. But in the midst of war crimes burn children, Zuko, we cut to him interacting with Iroh and Zhao and his crew, and suddenly, instead of being Mr. Faceless Monster Zuko, he acts exactly like a bratty teenager they all see him as. Or, in Iroh's case, a broken sad boy. So here's the problem. Instead of writing Zuko as a complex character who is fundamentally a good person but is doing terrible things in order to earn his father's love, these writers wrote three different facets of Zuko and just didn't combine them. And actually, they're not even facets. They wrote Zuko to act like whoever is interacting with him perceives him as. Against Katara, Sokka, and Aang, they remove all of his positive qualities and unique character traits and have him act the faceless monster they all expect Fire Nation soldiers to be. When interacting with Zhao and Ji especially, he acts like a spoiled brat prince who thinks that shouting can get him what he wants. When it's just him and uncle, we sue ooh ooh sad boy Zuko from season two, who's real, I love him, but like, he shouldn't be here. These are all pretty accurate in that that's how others see Zuko, but it's not accurate because Zuko acts like that, you know? Zuko should always act like Zuko, and we should understand from other people's reactions what they perceive him to be. For instance, Zuko's endless shouting, but never actually hurting anyone. Of course the main gang would hear the shouting and see the sparks and interpret it as a lethal attack. That doesn't mean Zuko was going to burn them. We know he wouldn't. And no matter how much they reasonably think he will, it shouldn't change that. The same action will be seen by Zhao and Ji as a teen throwing a tantrum. All bark, no bite, nothing to back it up but entitlement. This is actually probably the closest we get to actual canon season 1 Zuko. Um, Iroh would look and think about how sad it is that his gentle, kind nephew has been hurt so much as to act like this. But the key is that he looks at Zuko doing the exact same action and feel sympathy. Zuko doesn't suddenly transform into mid-season 2 Zuko whenever he's around. He's still shouty, angry boy season 1 Zuko, and Iroh just looks at him and sees a sad boy Zuko. 
Basically, they wanted to capture how the different characters perceive Zuko, and instead of making it about the other characters and their perceptions and assumptions, they literally split Zuko into three different characters. One, a nightmare, and two, the first steps of his redemption arc, anger and depression. Even though they're showing us through Zuko's actions, this is still an egregious example of tell, not show. For some reason, the writers can't figure out how to convey emotions or conceptualize that there is such a thing as misunderstanding. So instead of showing us that people can have different impressions, they tell us that Zuko is simultaneously everything that people assume him to be. Which just... isn't correct. Alright. Iroh. Iroh's hard, um, because he does feel like Zuko's loving uncle, but he also doesn't quite feel like Iroh. Let me explain. This man is not the crouching moron act of a plump, tea-loving, game-playing uncle. This is the dragon of the West, who loves his nephew. Which is what Iroh is, to an extent. But a key part of Iroh is that he's just a nice old man. And his strongest weapon is that even when people know that this is General Iroh, Dragon of the West, the way he acts makes them believe that he's just another harmless tea dude. As seen in the cartoon, when he's kidnapped by the Earth Kingdom, and when he's in the Fire Nation prison. In both situations, Iroh takes advantage of the fact that he's got this image of a funky old guy who just does weird things and uses it to his advantage. This Iroh acts like canon avatar Roku. He's serious, he knows what needs to get done, and he's straightforward about it. One of Iroh's funniest and most integral traits is his love of proverbs, which hints, of course, at his own nature, which appears soft and harmless and is hiding real power beneath. He speaks in proverbs so often that Canon Zuko doesn't know what he's saying half the time. This Iroh I don't think ever uses a proverb. He simply states exactly what he means at all times, which is another example of the show writers not understanding complex characters. Either they don't understand or they think the audience can't possibly grasp that Uncle who plays Pai Show and talks about tea and speaks in proverbs is still the Dragon of the West that everyone fears. So instead, they wrote the Dragon of the West who happens to like tea and Pai Show. And I like this uncle well enough, but it takes away much of his character to basically write season three post-prison uncle from the beginning instead of letting people who don't know possibly believe that he is just a nice old man. Grand Grand. Um, okay, this one might sound really uncharitable, but I really hope that this was all terrible directing choices because this woman scared the crap out of me. Like, I felt like I was jump-scared every time this lady spoke. You know the part of, the Harry, of, of Harry Potter where Nagini is wearing Bathilda Bagshot's skin? That's the energy. Instead of being this wise old woman who drops helpful hints, the writers reduced her to an info-dump character. And not only that, but they did it in the worst way. She recited the entire original opening verbatim. And that was the worst thing I've ever heard, which is saying something, because then I proceeded to watch the rest of this show. Also, she totally just, like, dropped the airbenders are dead thing on Aang and didn't even, like, hesitate. This is not a concerned grandmotherly figure. She didn't look at Aang and see a kid who happened to be the Avatar. She saw the Avatar, and I don't think she even noticed that he happened to be a child. They also have Grand Grand reveal that Aang is the Avatar instead of having Aang do it himself, which takes away from his character in so many ways. And the whole hiding a waterbending scroll from Katara? Like, the first... First of all, I'm of the opinion that since the southern tribe is based on Inuit culture, it should pretty much only have oral traditions, but... and scrolls are from the north, but I will not hold every adaptation to that. The existence of the scroll is fine, except that it's not because they made it this whole thing about Grand Grand and Sokka refusing to let Katara waterbend ever, just in case some firebender popped out of the snow like daisies and ashed her right there. Which is stupid, because Kana is always about her grandchildren learning and doing her best, and, and I don't believe for a second that Canon Grand Grand, who was originally from the Northern Water Tribe and left precisely because of women being told not to do things, 
would have been like, you know what? It's totally better to just leave her untrained. So if she does have to fight a firebender, she'll just die quickly. Because not bending doesn't make her less of a waterbender. It just makes her an easier target. Also, the, the whole North thing, they removed the plotline of Grand Grand being from the North, and that further removed her character as a cool, independent woman who won't be held down, and reduced her fully to nothing more than a blatant exposition character. Lieutenant G. The first time I felt anything about the show other than incandescent rage and horror wrought from betrayal was when G ran back to the ship after learning that Zuko was in danger and helped Iroh get Zuko to the escape boat only for it to explode. That was episode 7 of 8, by the way. Anyway, them having G betray Zuko to Zhao before he knew the story was sad, but I could see it because... He's he's an aggro man, you know. I actually liked that they made G and the others on the boat, the 41st Division, that Zuko saved. That was a nice touch. It was kind of fun. Um, if I had one problem with G, it's literally just that his sideburns are bigger and more ridiculous than Zhao's. Um, and he does have big ridiculous sideburns in canon. But I need Zhao's to be worse. Uh, because Zhao is the sideburns guy, not not G. That's That's my only problem with this G. Momo and Appa. Okay, so Appa was already here for the whole show, but I decided to put him with Momo because they have the same problem. Um, but first, I actually died laughing when Momo sacrificed himself to save that child in the North Pole. Like, actually. I was laughing, and also my spirit left my body, and I don't think I've been able to feel properly since. And then the Spirit Oasis, being at the Spirit Oasis to heal Momo and give a flimsy excuse for Yue being a waterbender. Genius, actually. It's, it's too hilarious to have notes, except for perhaps the note that I do not think the writers wanted it to be hilarious. Anyway, the thing with Momo and Appa is that they were characters in the cartoon. Appa has always been Aang's friend. He makes his own decisions and cares very deeply for his little airbender, and we love him. I saw exactly zero of this personality in the live-action Appa. He's a vehicle they used to get around, and cared about him like a pet, and uses him for terrible monologue practice, and that's it. Momo is much the same. I cared about Momo in the cartoon. If I hadn't watched the cartoon, then Momo sacrificing himself for that kid would have just been bafflement instead of the thin veneer of emotion that covered mostly bafflement that I did feel. Because they make a few token attempts with Momo, carrying fruit with Sokka, mostly harassing Sokka, but he still wasn't really a character, he was just a random animal they picked up. And if I didn't care about him from the cartoon, then his sacrifice would have just been like, huh, their monkey died. And then I wouldn't have thought about it again, because I only saw Momo like twice. Suki. Getting rid of Sokka's sexism should have changed the interactions between these two completely. Or, at the very least, they should have had Sokka just be impressed by the Kiyoshi warriors and ask to be taught by them without the sexism interlude, which would have ended up with the flirty sparring that we all know and love. But Sokka didn't need to be taught a lesson, and they didn't even make Sokka ask for one, but despite that, they have Suki just show up and beat him up. And the whole time, Sokka looks confused and uncomfortable. Not like he's having a good time. Which had the effect of making her all, ooh, ooh, I don't know how to talk to this boy I like, so I'm gonna beat him up. Aren't I so awkward and cute? And also, they made her mom the leader of Kiyoshi Village, which, combined with making Suki seem like the awkward and kind of socially stunted person they did, really completes an, ep like, an image of nepotism, which placed her as the leader of the Kiyoshi Warriors instead of climbing to the position by merit, which she clearly did in canon. Also, instead of going from, my priority is, to ke is keeping my island safe, to, the state of the world does concern me, as Canon Suki does, the entire episode in live action is about, like, teaching Suki that the outside world is bad. Like, instead of being a capable leader who decided to pri prioritize her people, she was presented as an ignorant child who was only protecting what she was told without thought of the further world. 
So yeah, they, they like nerfed Suki. Also, I hate that they had her take her makeup off. Uh, as previously mentioned, Suki's attempts at flirting have made Sokka visibly uncomfortable. She has this whole bit where she keeps staring at him until he's fidgeting and weirded out, and it makes me wonder if there are no men on Kiyoshi Island. Um, but then, after they have this slightly better flirty fight, she takes off her makeup magically in two seconds. She turns around and... Clean-faced. Um, well, actually, no, now she has, like, normal pretty makeup on. And only after she's wearing pretty makeup instead of warrior makeup does her attempt do her attempts at flirting start to really land. It's like the face paint Suki is warrior Suki and bare faced Suki is woman Suki, which completely undermines the original purpose of this episode, which was to drive in the point that Suki can exist simultaneously as a woman and as a warrior. It's not an oxymoron and one doesn't cancel out the other, but the removal of the makeup just when Sokka's starting to think she might be something other than just a terrifying warrior really does not support that. Kiyoshi. Kiyoshi is a veritable hurricane of violence. This is canon, and I approve. Zhao. This Zhao is nothing like canon Zhao, but I actually love him, and the changes they made are incredible. Um, Canon Zhao is this war dude, right, who keeps doing war things to impress the Fire Lord and has been a soldier forever and has personal beef with Zuko, etc, etc. You know, Mr. War Crimes himself. But this Zhao is like a pencil pusher who's never been into combat, and this attempt on the North is his first real campaign, which is insane, because no way would someone so experienced be given that opportunity, but I'll let it pass because it is hilarious um like pathetic zhao who's never run a campaign before is comedy gold and i'm here for it uh the only thing i wish they would have done is kept him having beef with zuko even with the new pencil pusher status especially with the pencil pusher status actually because i can just imagine can you just imagine zuko being super salty that loser zhao who'd never even left caldera until two months ago was showing up and chasing after the avatar like he had any experience like that would be hilarious zuko just being like this guy doesn't even do anything why is he here oh and more more ridiculous sideburns the sideburns need to be massive. But yeah, those are my only notes. Okay. Ozai. Okay, so I actually don't hate what they've done with Ozai, um, but I do think it has some problems called these guys aren't nearly good enough writers to pull it off. I will start with examples. Um, in the war room, Ozai asks for Zuko's opinion and seems legitimately disappointed when he doesn't give a satisfactory answer. This is important because he didn't ask the question to embarrass Zuko or put him in his place. This Ozai really seemed to believe that there was a chance that Zuko could give good war advice, which indicates that he has some faith in his abilities. We also get a scene of Ozai visiting Zuko and explaining his banishment, in which Ozai emotes and seems legitimately to believe that Zuko can regain his fictitious honor. The soldiers on Zuko's ship are revealed to be the 41st Division that were going to be sacrificed. In the cartoon, we aren't told anything specific about what happened to them, but I'm pretty sure we all know that Ozai sent those kids to die with glee, especially because his son defended them. But here, even though Zuko gets banished, Ozai actually does save the 41st Division, even if they're effectively banished too. Also, when the Avatar returns, Ozai says to Azula that Zuko found the Avatar, just like I told him to, and I quote. Which is a power move to show Azula that she could possibly be overtaken as the favorite child. And later, when Azula casually states that Zhao found the Avatar, Ozai not only corrects her that Zuko did, but goes so far as to say that Zuko, and I quote again, displayed resilience and dedication. That's what I expect from a future heir, not self-serving flattery and coy whispers. Not only complimenting Zuko, but actively saying he is better than Azula. So, so the big thing is that this AU Ozai either cares way more about Zuko and actually believes in him, or he's putting in a lot more effort to make it seem that way. 
The latter seems really unlikely because fostering such adoration to lead to blind devotion only to banish the child and probably hope they die in the meantime seems really stupid. Um, as mentioned, he's acting like this while giving news of the banishment, so it's not like it was an act that he dropped when he didn't have to use for it anymore, and he wouldn't have use for it if banishing his son to a wild goose chase he could never hope to accomplish, because he never should have seen Zuko again. And it isn't just to keep Azula in line, because she wasn't present for that conversation either, so there would be no reason to keep up the act while she's not there. Him actually believing in Zuko would be really interesting, actually, but it raises the question as to why he would banish Zuko to complete an, an impossible task. The way this works is if Ozai is legitimately insane. Like, canon Ozai was crazy. You know, you have to be to try to commit genocide. But he was aware of the world and how it worked. Like, the idea that the Avatar reappearing after 100 years is nonsense. And the truth that no matter how much he led Zuko to believe he cared because Zuko was a convenient pawn, he never cared about him, and in fact tried to have him killed several times because it was convenient. This Ozai, in order to both care more for Zuko and still banish him, must actually believe what he's saying about learning through pain and the Avatar being the Fire Nation's biggest threat, and actually sent Zuko to find said Avatar with the bonkers idea that he could possibly accomplish it. Which would explain the casual way he mentions it to Azula, like finding the Avatar was a foregone conclusion. This also explains G and them being the 41st Division. If Ozai hates Zuko, why did he save them in the first place instead of killing them as another lesson to him about his own powerlessness? And if he didn't want Zuko to have support, why crew his ship with a group of people who explicitly owe Zuko their lives? Zuko knows they're the 41st, and it would make sense to me that this Ozai is expecting his son to use that fact, that he, they all owe him their lives, to gain their loyalty. Either through fear or love doesn't really matter. I can see this being a twisted act of support. And like I said, this is actually a really interesting change, and I don't hate it. I think it would be fascinating to see it play out, because it would be even more of an emotional toll on Zuko. Because when he decides to betray Ozai, he wouldn't be met with, Yeah, well, I never loved you. Lightning strike! It would be, But you're my son. We could change the world together. And Ozai would actually believe it. Like... Zuko realizing his dad doesn't love him is rough enough. Can you imagine the horrible toll it would take on him to realize that Ozai does love him and he needs to betray him anyway? Ouch. It would be fantastic, and in the hands of any other writer, I would sell my soul to let it play out. Azula. Okay, I'm going to start with my thesis statement here. This Azula does not act like canon Azula, she acts like I imagine Zuko would have acted in the time between his mother disappeared and his own banishment. Albeit, you know, granted, more, more violent, because she is still Azula. Um, but hear me out. She does not have the confidence of canon Azula. She's shown to be consistently trying to do better and be more perfect, but not in the way that practically perfect canon Azula was, in the way that Zuko trying to bend lightning was. She's desperate to prove herself to Ozai and remain the favorite child, which never would have even crossed canon Azula's mind because she knows that Zuko is a pathetic failure in their father's eyes and she is perfect. She refers to games like luring the Fire Nation traitors to her father as things that she has to do, putting her life on the line to impress her father, while Zuko is off, and I quote, on a pleasure cruise. Canon Azula would have thrived luring people in like this, thought of it as a fun game, and would have taken grave offense to the idea that she could have even been in danger at all because she's one of the best benders in the world and there's no way they could have hurt her. I don't actually hate this as an adaptation choice, even though it does make me sad that we don't get my psycho lady that I know and love. Um, but especially with the changes to Ozai and him actually seeming to care about Zuko to some extent, I can excuse these differences. 
because because part of the reason Canon Azula is so sure of herself is because she knows and always has known that she's the favorite child of their father at least and she was superior to Zuko in every way. This belief in her own superiority easily made her arrogant and unafraid. In this version, where Ozai might have favored them equally even if it was to pit them against each other, that takes a lot of her confidence away. And she might even be afraid that if she messes up like Zuko did, then she'll be burned and banished like he was. And now that he's found the Avatar, he's proven himself worthy of Ozai's love again. This is even more of a possibility for her. So yeah, she's different. She doesn't act like Azula, but given the other changes, I don't hate it. Again, if only we had different writers. Jet. Who boy, our resident terrorist. Um, I can't even express how disappointed I am with this one. Because Canon Jet is already a complicated bastard, you know? He's a terrible person. He's a terrorist. He's allowed his good ideals and his thirst for revenge to combine into something monstrous. This Jet somehow is ruined in both directions. Made into more of a monster with shoddier motivations and presented as good in one scene. I will explain. So, a large problem here is that the episodes they combined for this to happen were terrible. Jet is, for some reason, blowing up Omashu, one of the last Earth Kingdom strongholds. And I know, you can justify it however you want. There are spies, etc, etc. I'll get more into this in the story choices section because I know how they could have fixed it, but I'll leave it at this for now. Jet isn't blowing up Fire Nation occupiers and happening to get some Earth people as well. He's bombing the Earth Nation. Straight up. He goes after King Boomy. To be fair, I also want to assassinate this King Boomy, but that's beside the point. Any complicated, shaky ideals that were driving him in the cartoon? Destroyed. Also, let's consider that we saw how Jet worked in a Fire Nation-controlled village versus an Earth Kingdom stronghold where he thought there were spies. You can claim that Jet didn't blow things up because he had some character development, but that's just not true. Jet didn't try to slaughter Zuko immediately because he'd had some character development. He was waiting for real proof instead of taking it into his own hands. Think of it like this. Jet saw the fire-controlled village as something like a tumor in its entirety, where you have to remove all of it, even if you get some normal cells at the same time, for the good of the body as a whole. Meanwhile, an Earth Kingdom stronghold would be a body in its entirety, which had tumors in it. You don't get rid of cancer by willy-nilly removing pieces of a body and hoping that's where cancer is. Jet may have bombed a Fire Nation secret lair and taken out some civilians as an acceptable loss. Sure, he may have killed the Fire Nation spies and then also killed civilians he thought were too close to them to have been innocent, even if those people really had been unaware that their supposed friend was a Fire Nation spy. But he wouldn't randomly blow up buildings just in case there might be a Fire Nation spy inside. That would be completely antithetical to his point. But then, there's the whole thing about him teaching Katara to waterbend. Which, first of all, why? But I'll let it slide, because he's just giving her advice on fighting, and not on bending stances or something, so, you know, whatever. I'll, I'll, I'll let it go. Um, but the advice he gives, let's, let's look at that. First, he asks why she fights, which is a great start. And then, when Katara starts having PTSD flashbacks about her mom, I was like, okay, okay, here we are. We're going to be all, use your anger, which would have been so in character for Jet, to tell Katara to fight while thinking of her mother and how she died. And that would be interesting because, as said earlier, Katara's bending is stronger when she's emotional. And we could have had an interesting side plot that didn't exist in the cartoon of Katara's bending being based on rage alone for a few episodes and maybe learning a more peaceful way from our resident monk. Like, wow. But no, Jet sees that Katara's having these flashbacks and instead of going, yeah, exactly, focus on that. He goes, no, not how she died. Think of her alive. 
And I honestly felt like that was more of a character assassination than him bombing the Earth Kingdom. Because Jet doesn't fight for the memory of living people. And he doesn't encourage others to. Jet is a well of festering hatred. And a large part of his ability to charm people is that he's capable of getting everyone whipped up into the same frothing rage based on their own personal injustices. The last thing he's ever going to do is tell you to let go of your anger, because your anger is what lets him control you. Teo. Oh, Teo. This kid got the same treatment as every other underage character in Avatar, which is most of them, by the way, if you forgot. They're all kids. Um, in that, they completely ignore that he's a child and make him unreasonably invested in the war and absolutely nothing else. Literally every other line he has is like about killing firebenders. The entire point of the mechanist working with the Fire Nation in the cartoon is to stop is to keep his son from seeing the true horrors of war and to keep him a child just a little bit longer. Teo isn't completely ignorant of the problems out there, of course. He's just as horrified as the rest of them when they find his dad's secret Fire Nation room. But the point is that he's still very much a carefree kid. Not this guy. Whoever this kid is has personal beef with every firebender in existence and would gladly see them all dead or do the deed himself if necessary. It just felt like another, the writers are making this darker and more adult without taking into account that perhaps making the show more adult doesn't have to involve giving the child characters lobotomies so that they act like adults, even though they're children. The Mechanist. I kind of have personal beef with Canon Mechanist, but that isn't relevant here. Um, what is relevant is that even though I dislike him as a person in the cartoon, I understand his motivations, and I know that his building things for the Fire Nation really is for the good of his people. This guy acts pretty much exactly like the Mechanist we know, and usually that would make it a really good adaptation. But then they put him in Omashu. They put him in the last, in, in one of the last remaining Earth Kingdom strongholds. And he's still betraying the Earth Kingdom for the Fire Nation? They can spout as much nonsense about spies as they want. There is no reason the Mechanist should have to betray one of the Earth Kingdom strongholds to personally fend off an attack. In canon, he was a good, misled man who was doing bad things to keep his family safe. This man is a Fire Nation sympathizer. There's no other explanation. There really isn't. That's, that's all he is. Mei and Tai Li. So I'm going to do these two together because the fact that they're kind of a set in both the original cartoon and in this really connects what they've done to the characters. Um, but first, I've seen some people complain about the actress for Mei and specifically how she's not the slender babe that they expected. Um, and I want to start this section with get out of here with that rancid attitude. Uh, we do not body shame in this house. Besides, I think it makes sense as a character choice. Um, it sets her apart from Tylee, who does acrobatics and walks on her hands in her free time and is shown to crave positive attention and has found that one of the easiest ways is to be pretty and appeal to men so that they fawn over her. On the other hand, Mei is a distance attacker. Even though she is shown to be fast and agile, which, by the way, you can be even if you don't look like Barbie, um, her main purpose is distance precision attacks. And she's a depressed darling who doesn't move without an impetus. So absolutely show me Mei, who isn't nearly as skinny as Tylee, because that's fantastic. All right, to characterization. They made Tai Lee a smile and a bucket of optimism, which isn't incorrect, especially because that's how canon Tai Lee strives to be perceived. The problem is that they gave every line where someone calls out Azula to May. Tai Lee might be the smiley optimistic one, but she's also the one confident enough in herself and her relationship with Azula to speak more freely. In the original draft of the cartoon, I've been told that Azula was a man and Tai Lee was supposed to be her love interest. And when they changed Azula to a woman, they basically didn't change any of their interactions because gals be in pals. 
Um, whether or not you ship it isn't my business. I only bring this up because that's one explanation for why Tai Li is supposed to be the one who can tell Azula the truth, or at least more of it, and not get in trouble. Oji Mei, meanwhile, is a depressed lady who hardly ever speaks, and when she does speak, it's blunt. She's not concerned with tiptoeing around and sparing your feelings. You've gone too far, and she's calling you out. This is covered in the rancid therapy on the beach episode. Mei was raised to be pretty and silent and punished for talking out of line. Azula may be her friend, but she's also her superior and insane, if you haven't noticed, in both the OG and this one. Mei does not speak freely around Azula, especially not the way Tylee does. I feel like they figured we wouldn't notice because Mei and Tai Li, especially in this, are presented as a group rather than individuals, a nebulous concept of Azula's friends. And the OG was so good at characterizing them and making them rounded that it's, it's just a shame. <sighs> Boomy. I don't even want to talk about what they did to Boomy. It, it pisses me off so much. Okay, I'll do it. Anyway, Canon Boomy is one of the funniest, coolest characters in the series. When Aang shows up and doesn't recognize him, Boomy takes the opportunity to pull a prank and teach a lesson at the same time, like the funky prankster who's one of the powerhouses of the secret world changing organization is wont to do. Everything he does seems cruel or insane, but when you understand who he is and the full extent of everything, it's not only harmless, but educational. He didn't put Aang's life in danger with the giant rabbit thing. That was Flopsy. He wasn't going to let Katara and Sokka be encased in rock and die. It was rock candy. Even though people do legitimately think Boomy's a nut job, Omashu is an Earth Kingdom stronghold for a reason. He is competent, and he is capable. The first red flag for Boomy's character is the idea that there are spies in Omashu. And also terrorists trying to blow up spies in Omashu, which shouldn't be happening because Omashu was a stronghold that doesn't have those problems. Boomy would take care of that immediately. Easy. And then they ruined any possibility of Boomy being redeemable when Aang recognized him immediately. Like, if Aang knows who Boomy is, then he should have the understanding that lets him see the true purpose behind the trials. Except there isn't one. In fact, the stated purpose of the trials in the live action is for Boomy to convince Aang that he's given up and that the world is, like, crap, I guess. I don't know. This man is a bitter old bastard who blames Aang for all the hardships of the world, he makes light of the airbender genocide, and he's legitimately trying to finish off the job by killing Aang. These aren't games meant to help Aang. He wants the Avatar dead. And when that doesn't happen, he tries to commit suicide. And honestly, the most damning part of all of this is that in the end, they still have Boomy slide down the mail chutes with Aang. Like they had kept the character the same. Like Boomy hadn't been blaming Aang for every problem in the last hundred years and trying to take his pound of flesh for it. Like they're friends. And honestly, at the end, when they mention finding an Earth teacher and all of them are like, Woohoo, back to Amash to get Boomy. I'm mad about it. None of them should ever want to speak to this man again. He should not be teaching Aang earthbending. And if I ever see this man again, it will be too soon. Far too soon. The Nomads. You might ask yourself, why were they in the caves under Omashu? And to that I say they're right. The acoustics would be fantastic in the cave. Checks out. Good Nomads. The Badger Mole. I am accusing them of character assassination of an entire species. Yes. Um, the feral, rage-filled way they have the badger mole come at Sokka and Katara in the cave only to stop because it smells... love? Look, badger moles are intelligent and kind creatures. They found Toph, tiny, blind Toph, as a child and taught her like one of their own. Do you think Toph, tiny and sobbing, smelled like love? No. 
these writers would have me believe that the badger moles would kill baby toff for daring to not stink of love in their presence she was sad so she would have died because yes okay in the cartoon Sokka and the nomads were scared of the badger mole but that's because it's a huge animal and it was approaching them it wasn't charging or attacking or anything it was curious and painting them as feral attack dogs is rude and I didn't think I'd be so offended by it, but I am. June. Um, I think they actually did fine with June. She's exactly the type of super cool bounty hunter lady we deserve. And the one change I noticed really was that she was flirting with Iroh instead of the other way around. And I actually adore that because I love Iroh. Don't get me wrong. But old man flirting with young lady. Blech. Yikes. Young lady flirting with old man? Fantastic. Love that for her. Live your truth. Wan Shi Tong. As a cameo, this was fine, I guess. Um, but I have to wonder again why we even met him? Wan Shi Tong comes up pretty far into season two. And these guys were already doing so badly with adapting the just season one material. So... What possessed them to drop in random season two stuff? Like the nomads as well. They sh uh, Anyway, the nonsense he kept spouting about humans being afraid of the truth isn't, like, wrong. Like, Wan Shi Tong is that exact type of bastard. But it was such a weird choice in the context of the episode because that's right before the hallucinations co-induces about Sokka and Katara's worst memories, and it just threw me the whole time. Like, was this the truth that Wan Chi Tong was warning about? Are we supposed to take away that Katara directly got her mother killed and it was her fault and Sokka will never be leader material? Because both of those are supposed to be misconceptions that a couple of kids have about themselves. But with the addition of Wan Shi Tong and his dumb humans fear the truth speech, it really seems like we're supposed to accept them as fact. So yeah, Wan Shi Tong was great, except that he shouldn't have been there, and everything he said beyond Sokka and Katara being in danger was directly detrimental to the story. Hey, bye! Can I accuse these writers of taking all the depth of, out of a character who's on screen for like five minutes and has no lines? I've done it before, and I am doing it again. In the original story, Heibai was the spirit of the forest, and when it burned down, he was blinded by rage and began destroying a nearby village and taking their people as retribution, even though they had not been the cause of the fire. When Aang figured out the problem and a way to calm the spirit, it took a whole dramatic fight before Heibai would listen, and the lesson about the forest regrowing only got through once his rage had calmed. In this, they made Ko the one who's stealing the villagers. Heibai wasn't terrorizing the village or the villagers. He didn't seem to be crossing over into the human realm at all. He was just rampaging around the spirit world, and instead of showing how he had to be talked down, out of grief, they skip the whole thing by having Aang give a truncated to the point of useless speech in front of the totem and then flying off. They told me that Heibai was an injured spirit, that he was hurt and not evil, several times even, but they didn't give Heibai the time to show it, destroyed their character development, and truncated their story to the point that the moral was lost. And it would have been better if they'd just made Ko the problem and left Heibai out of the forest entirely. Kaya. Uh, we don't see Kaya much in the cartoon, seeing as she's dead. Uh, so I don't really have much to say here, but I wanted to point out one thing. In the cartoon, when Kaya sacrifices herself, she thinks she'll be taken and put in prison. In this, she's clearly expecting to die. I don't think either is particularly better or worse, but it does change the tone of things. Kaya thinking she'll be taken alive and then suddenly being killed feels much more tragic than Kaya squaring up ready to be burned to a crisp. Um, and this is something the writers do multiple times, taking something tragic and making it more badass. I'll, I'll talk about this later. Hakoda. I love Hakoda. I adore Hakoda. 
like half of my fanfiction conception is dad Hakoda fix Hakoda adopting Zuko because Zuko deserves a cool dad because Hakoda is a lot of things, a great warrior, a fantastic leader, but most importantly to us, given the fact that his children are the main characters and family relationships are so blatantly paralleled in the cartoon, he's an amazing father. He makes mistakes, of course. He doesn't quite know how to interact with his kids after not seeing them for so long, but unwaveringly, he loves and supports them. And then... There's this. The whole thing with Sokka. The thing is that in the cartoon, a huge part of Sokka's character is that he's afraid that his dad is disappointed in him. Or will be, once they come back together and he finds that Sokka isn't the warrior he imagined. The key point of this is that it's an unfounded fear. Sokka is afraid of letting down a father who will never be disappointed in him like that. A very nice parallel, by the way, to Zuko, who is determined to prove himself to a father who will never acknowledge him. But that's a tangent. Um, it's shown in the cartoon that Sokka's fear is unfounded. Even when he messes up, like in the explanation of the invasion plan, Hakoda isn't disappointed in him. He's understanding, and he still believes in Sokka. But the live action, they absolutely tank Hakoda's character with the flashback about ice dodging. It's like the writers don't understand that inferences can be made from things that aren't text. And there's a such things as misunderstandings, which was already clear from the writing so far, but I'll get to that in section four. Um, but in this flashback, where Sokka has apparently passed his ice dodging test, which by the way, completely changes the tone of leaving him behind because that test would have made him a recognized adult of the tribe and therefore leaving him behind was absolutely the slight that poor cartoon Sokka thinks it is. They have Hakoda explicitly state that he just thought Sokka would be better and goes so far as to say that Sokka shouldn't be put in charge of people's lives, which he shouldn't have at age 13, but hey, let's ignore that. Um, he's disappointed in Sokka's behavior and performance, and he isn't discreet about it. This is character assassination. And it takes what was a very nuanced and interesting interaction between a father and son who love each other very much but have different ideas and expectations of each other, and clears it real neatly into Hakoda sucks as a father territory. Which is funny, given that they've handed... Ozai so many redeeming traits, like, what, what are they trying to do here? What, whatever. Ko the Face Stealer. So I think they made Ko more sympathetic in this, which is whack, seeing as they added a whole bunch of crimes to his name by having him do what Heibai was supposed to do, but like, he just wanted his totem back. Like, the totem that Roku stole from him for some reason? Like, why did Roku take his totem just to pull one over on Ko? It kind of felt like he just wanted to prove that he was better than Ko, so he stole his totem. Like, we, we don't get an actual reason as to why Ko shouldn't have this totem. And in fact, it is returned to him with minor complaint. Like, the totem clearly didn't do anything. Anyway... But we have all this new lore about Ko's mother and him constantly searching for an identity and giving him something of a motive. Um, and we also learn that Roku just stole his crap for fun, I guess, or to get back at him on Kurok's behalf. Who knows? Um, but when Ko gets the totem back, he just lets everyone go. Like, that was the plan the whole time. Which also doesn't make sense. Like, did he expect the Avatar to show up? What? Whatever. Um, Canon Co. is just a bastard who likes stealing faces because it's fun. Maybe he's looking for an identity and stuff, but largely it's just because he's a creature. He's a monster of opportunity, taking what comes to him. In here, he's not only he not only went out of the way to hunt, but he's like stockpiling people for a rainy day when he gets hungry. Which is a spirit. Spirits don't need to eat, but whatever. Um, but then he just, like, takes their faces when he does eat, so, like, what's the point of that? Like, it doesn't make much sense unless he was specifically stealing people to draw in the avatar in order to get his totem back. And it wasn't presented like that at all, so 
There were just a bunch of weird choices with Ko. It was very strange. The Fire Sages. Um, yeah, they existed. They were Fire Sages. Four traitors in one. Also a traitor, but like to the Fire Nation instead of the Avatar. Roku. I'm offended by what they did to Roku. After the absolute demo demolition of my boy Boomy's entire character, boiling him down till there was nothing left but salt and sadness, you look me in the eyes and you make Roku a funky guy? Literally, watch the introduction that he has. Is it not customary to bow before your elders? And to avert your eyes? And hop on one leg? <laughs> this would have been perfect for Boomy. Which means they could have written a better Boomy. And what? They realized they'd mixed up which character was which after filming episode four and were like, maybe no one will notice. Ugh. Anyway, Canon Roku is a serious man. He shows up, he talks about destiny and responsibility and the necessity to act to avoid consequences like he had suffered. He gives Aang the deadline of the comet to work towards, becoming the adult voice that puts a timeline on all of Aang's funny goofing. Except, in this, they screwed Aang's character so much that he doesn't need that, and they didn't even have Roku mention the comet at all, so Roku has no reason to be here except the one they fabricated about Ko stealing those people, which does nothing to further the story. It's just a weird aside where we get some admittedly interesting lore about Ko, and I wish they'd left it out entirely. So yeah, terrible Roku. Arnook. Uh, not much to say about Chief Arnook, save for the changes necessitated by the attempted bodlerization of sexism. Uh, he sure was a chief. Paku. Honestly, the worst part of this Paku is that the, the complete removal of the Grand Grand plotline, it does arguably make him a better person, though, since the implication, to me at least, in the cartoon isn't so much that Paku saw the inherent flaw in his sexist ways, but rather that he only changed his tune because his sexism had a direct negative impact on himself in the form of his lady love ditching his sorry ass. Otherwise, he's still a sexist piece of trash, so there's that. Yue. I don't dislike what they've done with Yue in general, but I do think that, like everything else related to the North and the other sexism arcs, her character was cheapened by the attempted removal of sexism. In the cartoon, Yue was a strong princess who always did what she felt was right, but it was very much within the confines of the role society had given her. She would marry for the tribe, even though it was Han who was objectively a terrible person because that's what she had to do. She would sit silently through meetings where she was literally not allowed to speak. She would accept any pittance of freedom or celebration given to her by her sexist father and her sexist society and smile and be gracious because that's what she thought was necessary. And honestly, she is such a strong person for that. Like, I would have devolved to primal violence in two seconds. Like Katara! Love that. Violence against the patriarchy. Uh, anyway, the end of her arc being a self-sacrifice, um, turning into the moon, might seem like it's just more of the same. More duty, more responsibility, more being forced to endure things for other people's sakes, but it's the opposite of that. She realizes what she can be done, and realizes that she's the only one who can do it. It's a sacrifice, but it is not a sacrifice of inaction, like her whole life has been up to this point. She had been sacrificing her personality, her happiness, for the men in her life. Then Tui, a female spirit by the way, dies, and Yue realizes that this time, instead of sitting still to please a man, she can be an active participant in her own story. She can make the hard decision, even if it is a sacrifice, and she does it herself. Even with Sokka telling her not to. Which, you know, obviously, 
he doesn't want her to. Like, no shade on Sokka for telling her not to sacrifice herself. But, like, you know. The point is that Yue is being used to being told what to do by the men in her life, and she knows that Sokka and her dad, and pretty much everyone probably, would be like, no, don't do it. And she's like, you know what? I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it. Yue's life of, like, forced inaction and silence ends with a decision and possibly the first deliberate important choice she has ever been allowed to make. This Yue is a spiritual leader. She does whatever she wants. She broke off the relationship with Han, even though this Han would have been a great chief because she doesn't love him. This Yue is not trapped by either the patriarchy or by responsibility of the crown, and so the end where she sacrifices herself isn't the accumulation of a fantastic character arc, it's just... More of the same. Han. One of the biggest red flags in this entire series is that Han is, unequivocally, my favorite character. There's a part in the final battle where a whole house collapses on Katara, and I was like, oh no. And then it cut to Han facing off against seven firebenders in a glorious last stand, and I was like, no, not my boy, anyone but him. Take Katara, take Sokka, take Aang for all I care, just not Han. Which is a problem, you know? That's, that shouldn't be how I act about Han or the main characters. But Canon Han is a... He's a crystallization of everything wrong in the Northern Water, water Tribe. The sexism, the male entitlement the classism, the insistence on doing things their way even when literally anything else would make more sense. So with the moral sanitization the live action does, it's not surprising that they completely changed his character. Um, I love this person. He's not Han. But I wish that we were following him on an epic quest across the world instead of these pale imitations of our beloved main cast. Avatar Kuruk. I'm gonna be really honest, I don't know enough about Avatar Kuruk to say anything about this. Like, I know that Ko stole his girlfriend's face, but that's pretty much the only thing I know. Um, but given that they've done such a horrible job with everyone else, I'm gonna give him the benefit of the doubt and assume that he's a much better person and much cooler character than we see here. Yagoda. Yagoda has always been a victim of the patriarchy. Every woman in the North is, of course, but in their endeavor to rid every nation but the Fire Nation from problematic tendencies, they've made her one of its biggest advocates. In the cartoon, Paku gives the speech to Katara about, women's, about a woman's place, and for some ungodly reason, the writers here decided to make Yagoda say it instead? Like, what? Is OG Yagoda resigned and quite possibly even content in her position? Yes. But she never espouses to actually believe that women can't fight or, or that they belong in the huts. She learns that Katara is Kaya's grandchild and she's proud of her friend for her bravery at leaving their crappy society. She's existing within the bounds set for her, but she isn't holding anyone else in place. I cannot fathom the thought behind making Yagoda the most blatantly sexist person in the North. Like, did they think she needed a bigger part and didn't even consider the words she was saying? Did they think that having a woman tell another woman that her place was in the kitchen would be less problematic, instead of a sign of a far more deep-seated problem with that society? But then the next episode, she's like right next to Katara calling Paku an old fool and saying their traditions are holding them back. So like, whatever, there's, there's just no consistency with the, with the writing or anything. Okay, we're on to our last one. Last characters. Paku's other students. These guys are a case study in, is there sexism or isn't there? Because you want me to believe that all these boys raised on the idea that women are too weak to fight see Katara completely fail to beat Paku. And she did fail, despite what Sokka implies. She didn't even get the win of kinda changing his mind like she did in the cartoon. It was a complete loss. So these boys see a woman fail to beat a master. Which, as someone without training, she did fantastic, don't get me wrong. But there's absolutely no way 
that a bunch of sexist raised boy children don't immediately grab onto that with both hands as confirmation bias and go see she can't fight women can't fight we didn't see much of these guys in the cartoon um but i would bet actual money that the first time katara showed up to train every single one of them were making sexist comments whether it be about going back to the healing huts or protecting her from the others whether they think they're being chival chivalrous or horrid they're all sexist we only see them sopping wet and pouting on the ground after being absolutely smashed by Katara. Note that they're pouting on the ground. Not a single one of them is running over and being like, Master Katara, Master Katara, you're so cool. They feel emasculated and they can't do anything about it because they're not as strong as her. It's Sokka on Kyoshi all over again. But for want of purging the story of expertly handled problematic topics that are essential for the storyline, the writers have simply removed the consequences of a society steeped in sexism. Which is worse, in my opinion, than removing sexism altogether. All right, we are on to part four, overarching themes. So... <laughs> The biggest problem here, um, the first thing we're going to talk about is moral sanitization and bodhorization, which basically means the removal of problematic things, um, not in a, you know, this was actually problematic, this did not age well kind of way, but in a, I don't want to see this even if it's actually presented well kind of way, you know? For example, the removal of sexism as a whole. Um, in the original show, we had several arcs pertaining to sexism, which very easily and neatly put it into a sexism is not only bad, it is completely nonsensical. For example, the Sokka on Kyoshi arc, where Sokka was like, you can't have beat me up, you're a girl, and then proceeds to get beat up thoroughly because his idea that women can't be strong is not only dumb but it's just like completely incorrect factually um and then it shows him having to deal with that where he like has this moment of like i have been emasculated and i'm angry about it and then he's like wait am i the problem um and that's you know the big thing in the original is that all the sexism was presented as the people being sexist were the problem. Which is good. Well handled. But I just, for a show that espoused a desire to make a children's cartoon more adult and more leaning towards older audiences, they really did a lot of moral sanitization and removing of hard topics. Um... I wouldn't go so far as to say that the live action is more suitable to children because I think it's atrocious, as I have previously expressed about all of the characters. But yeah, they they remove like every good lesson about sexism. They remove all of the ones that were handled well, and then they like kept Paku, but then instead of like handling it in any sort of okay way they had Paku be sexist and then they removed every consequence of that sexism like I just said in the Paku students category they kind of have the sexism and then they undermine every single lesson that we could have possibly learned about it being wrong mm -hmm. um another way this happens is that Katara when the attack on the north happens right she has previously said, right after she fights Paku and loses the first time, she says, you know what? Only I can decide when I fight. And I'm like, cool, that's awesome. I love that for you. Except then, the next 20 minutes, maybe? I don't know, because the snow starts falling right then, right? Um, so the Fire Nation attacks, and what does Katara do? Katara does not run to the front lines and start fighting. Katara runs to Paku and starts, like, 
begging him to let her fight. And he, she gathers the ladies and they're going to fight, except they don't go fight. They go and they ask Paku for permission to fight, which completely undermines all of the previous, like, stated lessons about, like, not needing his approval. So the one character that they were like, yeah, you have to be sexist for the plot, they not only, like, didn't handle it well, but they, like, made it so that his not being sexist was a prerequisite to any woman having progress. Like, he was an impassable barrier for them for some reason, and it makes no sense, because in the original, right, Sokka's sexist, that doesn't stop Suki from kicking his ass, you know? Like, if you actually have this dude, like, bar these women, when in situations where they could go around him, and they instead defer to his judgment, that's just, it's just not good. It's not good. They removed the sexism, and then they made it also worse. In other moral sanitization things, they removed a lot of problematic character traits from the good guys, which everyone has problematic character traits, okay? Like, that's what makes people people. That's what make well-rounded characters well-rounded. Every single character, even the ones that we adore, have problematic character traits. But not these guys, because these guys... We cannot possibly have any negative character traits for them. For example, Sokka, sexism, of course, removed. Uh, Katara's rage, gone. Talked about that in her section. Um, Aang's tendency to run away. Like, he's not a goofy kid who can't focus and runs away from responsibility. Aang is the most responsible person Quite possibly in this entire show, which is problematic. That's, that's, oh, I hate it so much. Anyway, they removed that. Um, Heibai, they removed that he was the one kidnapping the villagers. They wanted Heibai to be just a unproblematic sad boy. And so they made, made him one. So good for them, I guess. Um, Yue, her helplessness in the face of her, you know, sexist society they removed that she's super cool always capable which i love for her but again made her kind of a flat character instead of a character with an arc um han's entire character everything about og han was problematic everything about this han fantastic adore him great still a complete moral sanitization of what was going on and Paku's student sexism as well. Uh, and a lot of these I already talked a lot about in their individual, you know, character analysis. But I just thought I'd stack them up here so that you could see that this is a consistent problem instead of an isolated one. Uh, we also had removal of redeeming traits in villains. Uh, for example, Jet, the terrorist, who instead of kind of having an idea that he was he, he was not good for blowing up that village obviously we all know that but he had a lot more of a solid reasoning in the cartoon than they gave him in the live action in the live action he's just a crazy terrorist who's blowing things up zuko as I already stated, he has this whole super evil alter ego that they just, like, remove all positive traits that Zuko has whenever he's facing Aang or Katara or Sokka. So, there's that. And Ko, as well, we talked a little bit about in his... Because he just suddenly... Is doing all the evil stuff that Heibai was supposed to be doing... They just, like, gave him the evil stuff that Heibai was supposed to be doing, which, again, is more of a sanitization of Heibai than an evilization of Ko, because, as I said, Ko is kind of more compelling in this one as a sympathetic character, but irrelevant. Let's see, other things they morally sanitized. Um, kind of the Air Nomad Massacre, and this is how I'm... Because in the original... They didn't just happen to destroy all of the air nomads 
at once. It's it's never like explicitly stated in the original, um, but it does show that they set to attack all four of the air temples at the same time. Whereas in this, they had every single air nomad in existence, I guess, gather at Aang's temple for a festival, which first of all makes absolutely no sense, but second of all, it it's, yeah, they just like had them attack that one temple. Um, and then after that, you know, it was like a whole big thing where like airbenders must have escaped, but they were hunted down. And for some reason, the, the single attack on one temple feels like a gross simplification of exactly how far the Fire Nation went to destroy the Air Nomads. Ah, uh, the moral sanitization of other nations as well. In the Water Tribes, it was the sexism. We got rid of that. In the Earth Kingdom... There is this whole thing in the original cartoon where the Earth Kingdom are just, like, really cruel to their prisoners. Uh, especially their firebending ones, they will go and they will crush their hands so that they'll never bend again, right? And we see this cruelty when Iroh is kidnapped. Um, and they know he's the Dragon of the West in their brains, right? But they they really just have this old man you know? And they're being, like, kind of horrible to him throughout the whole journey, and he, like, makes this vague escape attempt, and they try to crush his hands for it. In this, they give one of the soldiers personal beef with Iroh because his brother died on, like, the ramparts of Ba Sing Se. Um, and giving this soldier a personal reason to want to hurt Iroh kind of takes away the fact that it was just a act of war, you know? It was supposed to show that these Earth Kingdom people are taking the war just as badly as the Fire Nation, as everyone else, and they have dehumanized firebenders and that's a problem it is like the firebenders have dehumanized everyone else but that doesn't mean that we can forgive the earth kingdom for doing it back you know so yeah giving giving this random earth kingdom dude a personal reason to hate iroh removes the cruelty bred through war that was demonstrated in the original when they didn't have personal beef, but he still wanted to, like, take out Iroh. Second overarching theme, friendship. And specifically, I think they must have been taking some notes from the movie that must not be named, because every second we get someone new telling us that friendship is bad and the Avatar can't have friends and all of this stuff about, like, the Avatar must be alone, blah, blah, blah. In fact, the first person who brings this up is Aang himself. Gyatso tells Aang that he's the Avatar, and Aang's first words to him upon learning this are, Can't I keep pretending I'm your friend? Like, why does Aang think that being the Avatar makes it so that he and Gyatso can't be friends? It makes no sense. It's weird. But it seems to be a consistent thing in this universe. Um, because pretty much every single Avatar tells him this when he, like, meditates and, and talks to them. Um, and Boomy when he is saved from his suicide attempt by Sokka, accuses Aang of cheating because he has friends, and he tells Aang that the Avatar must be alone. And like, again, why? Why is this happening? Why is this a consistent thing? And later in the Northern Water Tribe, when Paku and Arnuk are talking to Aang and they're like, it's going to be okay because the Avatar is here. And he's like, oh, I actually haven't 
done anything that I promised I would by, you know, trying to become the Avatar. I've just been chilling, even though I keep making serious faces and talking about responsibility. I don't do anything. Basically, that's, that's, what, that's what was said, even if it wasn't what Aang said, you know? But basically he says this, and Paku and Arnook are like, well, how the heck did you survive? How did you get to the Northern Water Tribe if you don't know anything? And Aang goes, well, because I have friends. And immediately Paku and Arnook are like, oh. Oh, well, the Avatar's useless. I guess we can't rely on him. And leave. Because he relies on his friends instead of doing everything himself. But yeah, so all of the other Avatars, Paku, Arnook... Boomy, Aang himself, every single one of them goes, the Avatar cannot have friends. And I'm just like, where did this come from? Why did this come from? There's one place this could come from, and we don't like that place. That's a bad place. It's a horrible place. Everyone agrees that that is, is a bad place. Number three, overarching themes. Tragedy and turning it badass instead. So I mentioned this in a couple of things. For example, showing the Air Nomad Massacre and how exactly it went down. Because the Air Nomads did fight back to an extent. Um, we do see that there are, like, corpses of Fire Nation soldiers in the Air Temples. Um, specifically, there's a crap ton around Gyatso. However... It is generally accepted, and the way that Gyatso's positioned when Aang finds his corpse kind of tells a story, because Gyatso is sitting in the middle of a room, and he's just sitting there, and he is surrounded by firebender corpses. And the general agreement that I have heard people come to, and I generally agree that this this makes sense, is that Gyatso didn't jump up and do a whole bunch of fancy tricks and like, wah, you know? He sat down in that room and he sucked the air out of that place. And you know what fire needs to burn? Air. So not only would that slowly suffocate the firebenders, but in the meantime, they couldn't use their fire. And that really wouldn't make the type of exciting fight scene, I think, that this production was going for pretty much the entire time. So they didn't do it. They instead had all of the airbenders just throw hands immediately and start doing all these really cool airbending things and wha. And I think that really takes away from the tragedy of this peaceable people getting slaughtered. Because they did fight back, but they didn't do it in a flashy, like, violent way. You know, like, I just feel like the Air Nomad Massacre should have been treated with a lot more um, solemnity instead of being like, ooh, how many cool firebending and airbending punches can we throw in here? And it, it just would have been really nice to have just like that moment of kind of like horror instead of like trying to elicit the, ooh, yeah, get him, Gyatso reaction, you know? And then, let's see, um, another part of taking tragedy and making it badass I already talked about was Kaya's death, where she, in the original she thought she was going to be taken prisoner, but then she was killed, and that was, like, horrifying, uh, versus this, where they had her already know that she was going to die, which isn't necessarily a worse choice, which I would argue that the making the Air Nomads a... Rock'em Sock'em robot fight was a, a worse choice, but it's it, it just kind of slips in with the other things that they did this to. Um, the third one is the most egregious, and I probably would have left the first two alone if it didn't exist, but three makes a pattern, uh, is Zuko fighting back during the Agni Kai. Because they really have 
it seems a vendetta against people being helpless. And it's important that Zuko didn't fight back in the Agni Kai, you know? That's like, part of his entire character is that he cannot stand up to his father. Like, his whole character arc is reaching for the point where he is able to stand up for his father, where he's able to see past what he previously thought and do something about it. But in this, 13-year-old Zuko not only, like, immediately throws hands with his dad, but he almost beats him, which, again... Are we really saying that Aang is going to have trouble taking out the Fire Lord if his 13-year-old failure of a son could have done it if he didn't hesitate? Like, we don't have a single bender in any of the other nations who could possibly have bested Zuko when he was 13 years old. Are you telling me that? Because that's nonsense. Like, Ozai's supposed to be scary. And now I'm not scared of him because 13-year-old Zuko could have won that Agni Kai easy if he was just a little more ruthless. And that is not the lesson that I should have learned from the Agni Kai. I should have learned that Ozai is willing to burn the face off of a sad child who's not fighting back. Um, this kind of ties into the next part, which is horrid pacing choices, because their vendetta against quiet, tragic moments kind of bleeds into everything else as well. They took out every single calm and chill scene and just skipped straight to every single fighting scene. And if there wasn't fighting, and if it was chill then they made it fighting, which was the whole turning tragedy badass thing. They skipped the training in the north. That's probably the most egregious example here, is that right after Katara, like, fails to beat Paku, they have the snowfall. So there's no training in the north, which means that Katara shouldn't have, like, been any better at waterbending than she was literally an hour earlier, so whatever, but the pacing is horrendous. It makes no sense that Katara is a waterbending master now because they didn't have her train in the north at all. They removed all of the scenes where it was just the characters traveling, where it was just them talking. Uh, it removed the moment in the air temple where they like they land and they have Aang showing them his home excitedly and he's having a great time before they find the firebending like skeletons and the monks skeletons, you know? They remove all of the scenes that give us these characters and skip straight to the ones that they think will be the biggest emotional punches or the biggest cool fighting scenes. And it really just removes so much. I also wonder how big they think the Avatar world is because there's never, like I said, any travel time. And there isn't even any implied travel time, really. Like, in the cartoon, they make a point that on the way to the north, Appa is like flying low and he's like really tired because he's been flying for a really long time and it's just open ocean and they can't find the north and it's been really long. They don't spend an entire episode showing me that they've been traveling. They literally just give a couple lines of dialogue to be like, Appa is exhausted because we've been traveling for a really long time without landing. They didn't even try to do that in this they just like one one thing we're here and then we're here and because there's no indication it really felt to me like they sped run the entire like thing all eight episodes happened in like a week or something i don't know how much time i was supposed to believe passed but i do not think i felt like it passed as much as they wanted me to feel like it passed you feel me and then, oh, hard work 
versus natural talent. Again, this is another thing that I am confused why they did this so badly when they wanted it to be adult-focused, you know? Like, kids don't care if one person is really bad at bending and then the next episode they're, like, the master. They're not gonna really notice. They're just gonna be like, ooh, yeah, that was a really cool bending move. But as an adult, I would like you to acknowledge that it takes a lot of hard work, you know? And I would like you to at least be consistent about it. Because this whole thing... Like, they're very bad at being consistent about what's hard work and what's natural talent and how much is needed of both. And especially, they tell me that hard work is needed a lot and that excuses them not being good. Except then something happens and they didn't work it at all, but they're really great now. For example, Aang. All they do in the first five episodes, in the first four episodes, is talk about how Aang doesn't know anything about the Avatar state, how Aang can't do anything related to Avatar stuff, he doesn't know what he's doing, etc, etc, etc. But in episode five, he is somehow naturally just a fantastic spirit bridge. Like, all of a sudden, the people of the village are like, Avatar, our people have disappeared. And Aang, like, closes his eyes, and there's, like, a little spirit vision thing, and he goes, they're in the spirit world. And I'm like, how did you know that? Is it because you're the Avatar? Were you able to just do that because you're the Avatar? Why haven't you been able to do anything else because you're the Avatar? Have you been able to do this the whole time? I'm just confused about how much Avatarness is about you and how much is just because it happens and they don't do a good job of separating those two and there's also katara katara's entire bending journey goes here i do not even have a clue of what to do with this okay i will just give you a a, a quick rundown of how katara's bending progresses throughout the series ready so in the beginning she can't even lift a water bubble. Seriously. They say that. She has never been able to lift a water bubble and keep it in shape until Aang gave her pointers. Which is disrespectful to OG Katara, who taught herself, like, three or four moves. You know, she didn't do them particularly well because she was self-taught. She didn't know what she was doing. But she could move water. And she could, like, you know start doing things, but Katara couldn't even lift a bubble until Aang told her how to bend, okay? Except then at the very end of that episode, they're on Appa, Aang is falling, Zuko shoots a fireball at them, and it's not the Avatar state that saves them. Katara, who could not lift a bubble before this, lifts the entire ocean in a pillar to stop the fireball from hitting them. Okay, so she's making progress. Except then, the next episode, we're like with the water scroll, right? And it's established that she now, again, cannot do anything unless she is explicitly being told how to do it because of the water scroll. So that whole pillar nonsense, she can't lift water like that anymore. That's that that was a natural talent thing that only applied to that one moment. We're back to hard work. She doesn't have any natural talent. It's all about work now. And then like right after she learns all of the scroll moves, all of a sudden she's like making up her own things, you know? She sees another bender do it, and all of a sudden she can do it perfectly, such as with that, you know, thing that she throws the ice discs. Wow! And I'm like, fine, you know, you can look at people and, like, copy their moves. That's, like, kind of the whole point of, like, combining styles and stuff. That's cool. Except it's already said that Katara doesn't know how to do that, 
anyway, but Katara's ability to bend keeps vacillating wildly throughout the series with no consistency and no reason for it. Um, coming to a peak right after she fights Paku. So she fights Paku, she fails at fighting Paku, but then suddenly is declared a master by everyone for no reason, even though she's really not, and she should not be. It's nonsense. But she goes, and during the attack, Zuko finds her, right? And Zuko is fighting her, and Katara is whipping out these moves that she's never seen anyone do before. She's never seen anyone encase someone in a water sphere like that. She was not taught that move, and she's not copying that move from anyone. All of a sudden, Katara, having just lost to Paku and not doing anything else, is a master waterbender who can just make up her own moves because she is so naturally gifted. And it's just so stupid that they did that. It makes no sense. But yeah, Katara's entire waterbending journey is them vacillating wildly between Katara is a super cool waterbending prodigy and Katara couldn't do anything unless you hold her hand through it. Like, impossible. And that's about how they treat everything else in this series that has to do with hard work versus natural talent. They just can't decide. And instead of doing one, then the other, or whatever, they just do whatever works best in the moment without regard to the overall story. Okay, uh, next one. I just wanted to bring up that the Fire Nation only has one strategy, and sometimes it's a good strategy. It does make sense in some cases, but excusing it as every... everything is just ridiculous. So, the first time we hear about this in this live-action show is the beginning when the Fire Nation makes the Earth kingdom think they're going to be attacked so that they can kill the airbenders which sure sure i'll allow that i don't know exactly why that would make it particularly easier but i will accept that there is a whole bunch of shenanigans that i don't know about that are going on and it would make it easier sure so that's the first thing that's also how they plan to use the 41st they have one thing where you think that the main attack is here, but instead it's here, you know? And that's the basic premise of the Fire Nation's only move. And then that's Zhao's attack on the north as well. We've got this whole frontal assault, but actually the attack is Zhao going over the wall in this balloon to kill the, the spirits. Again, Makes sense. That one, that one makes sense. Except then, like, the, f <laughs> the attack on the North fails, right? And when Ozai gets news of this, he's like, Just as I expected. It was all a ploy, so that they'd never see this coming. And then it reveals that they, like, took Omashu at the same time. Except, like, first of all, why why does attacking the North have anything to do with Omashu? Omashu doesn't care if the North is being attacked. Omashu didn't send troops to help the North, which would have weakened their own defenses. And in the end of episode four, I believe, when they're with Bumi, they get confirmation that the Fire Nation is coming to attack Omashu. So... So they already knew that Omashu was going to be attacked. Why are you now telling me that you took them by surprise? Like, it it was in the dialogue. Like, I, I don't get it. Like, 
you do understand that sometimes attacks just fail. Like, I feel like maybe they were trying to make it so that Ozai was more impressive again after, as I said, he almost got beaten up by a 13-year-old who didn't even want to fight him. But it just really makes it sound so dumb. Like, it makes no sense. And then we've also got um, avoiding your problems till they go away, which, again, very good adult theme going on here of just ignoring things instead of dealing with them. What on earth were these writers doing? But, for instance, on Kiyoshi Island, Aang goes, he's trying to figure out things about the Avatar, he meditates, and when the island is attacked, instead of dealing with it himself, Kiyoshi takes over, and Kiyoshi deals with it. And then, no matter how much Aang talks about controlling the Avatar state and learning the elements, he doesn't do anything to do that, because every time they go to a new shrine, he just asks that Avatar to solve his problems for him. They, like, go to the north, and he's like, Kuruk, we're being attacked by the Fire Nation. You should come on over here and possess me so that we can fix that. And when Kuruk says no, what does he do? He goes and talks to the koi fish, and he goes, Hey, koi fish, I've learned that I don't have to deal with my own problems. How about you do it instead? And he's, like, more than willing to be the vessel of destruction. He just doesn't want to actually do it himself. Like, it's it's weird. Uh, and the other thing about that, let's see, another ignoring your problems until they go away. Katara's waterbending. I already went through everything they did with Katara's waterbending. Basically what happened, to sum it all up, is that Katara just did whatever until someone called her a master, and then all of a sudden she was a master. And it had nothing to do with anything before that. It just... The problem fixed. <laughs> and the last and most egregious example is Bumi, who is supposed to be in charge of Omashu, which is supposed to be the stronghold Omashu, right? But instead, he's got spies and terrorists, etc., 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 and he's just content to sit around and let it happen. Who knows why? He doesn't care. Doesn't matter to him that the entire world is dying. Who cares? Ridiculous. Ah. And finally, the last one of these I have is changing intentionality of character decisions. And what I mean by that is either adding or removing how much a character meant to do an action, which does a lot for to establish their character, right? What they meant to do, what they didn't mean to do. It really kind of makes a really solid basis for who they are, but they changed a lot of the intentions behind our main character's actions, which changes them fundamentally as characters. So first of all, Aang. We have several instances of loss of intentionality. For instance, I already mentioned a couple of these in the actual Aang section, so I won't go super into it, but in the beginning, when Aang isn't running away, he's just taking a flight to clear his head, that removes his intention to run away, his intention to escape from all of his responsibilities and instead it makes the whole being stuck in an iceberg for a hundred years just like, oh wow, what crazy random happenstance, you know? Like, two, Gran Gran reveals that Aang is the Avatar. Aang does not reveal Aang is the Avatar. In the original cartoon, this was like a huge step for Aang, being like, busting back in and being like, I am the Avatar, because he didn't want to be the Avatar. And now you can see that he's decided that the safety of these people is more important than his personal 
well-being or his personal comfort, you know? But instead, he's just wandering around the village and Grand Grand just appears and looms and is like, You're not just an airbender. You're the Avatar. And outs him in front of everyone, completely removing the significant part of Aang's character where he is like, no, I have to own up to this. Another one. Uh, Aang declares he's going to learn the elements and then doesn't. Whereas in the original, even though Aang was still kind of trying to avoid being the Avatar, he worked his gosh darn best to learn the elements, to become the Avatar, even when he didn't want to. So they like had him state his intention and then completely ignored it. And then they actually added some intentionality to his character because in the original, right, Aang is just kind of wandering around. He's having a good time. He's doing his nonsense stuff, right? He doesn't, he's, he's just going places on impulse. But they remove every sort of impulse that he has. He's never going to Kiyoshi to ride the giant koi fish. He's going to Kiyoshi to talk to Avatar Kiyoshi so that he can learn about the Avatar state. They're not going to the north because he thinks waterbending's cool and Katara needs a master. They're going to the north because it's going to be attacked and it's going to be a tragedy. And they need to stop it. So they like add this really insane intention to all of his movements, which really is one of the reasons he does not feel like a 12 year old. All right. Katara's intentionality. She, as I said, never learned anything before she got the waterbending scroll, before she got deliberate instructions. So they took away her internal like impetus to learn. They just removed it. She can't do that anymore. That's not important. And also, another one is that getting the waterbending scroll, it was given to her by Grand Grand. She, in the original, stole that scroll from pirates because it was important to her, both because of culture things, but mostly because she was so determined to learn waterbending that she didn't care what kind of rules she broke to do it. Instead, it was just handed to her, and we don't see that Katara's, you know, desire reflected in the same way. And the last one I have here is Zuko. So uh, one of the things they have him do is they have him just, like, accidentally hurt things and burn things, but they also have... <laughs> <laughs> they they do it both ways here. So he they have him set things on fire on accident when he's fighting and stuff. For example, in Omashu, or when he's just feeling angry, he'll just like light things on fire and do that stuff. When in the original Zuko has a lot of problems, but he knows how painful fire is. We can all see he knows how painful and dangerous it can be. So one of the things that sets Zuko apart from Zhao is that he does not set things on fire unintentionally. If it's meant to be on fire, he meant it to be on fire. Whereas they also do the opposite, where they like, he keeps setting things on fire on accident because he's doing other things, and he also keeps threatening people with fire intentionally. For example, as stated earlier, Sokka, Katara, and even Zhao. He threatens his entire life with fire. Um, and in the Pauhai escape, it's kind of hard to see, but they actually have Zuko cut Aang's neck during the escape. Like, when he's threatening him to, like, get them to open the gates. And I feel like they added that so that it could be more clear or like more of a threat so that Zhao would take it seriously or something like they made it made it feel more adult in some way I don't know but it was it's dumb because Zuko doesn't do things like that on accident and he certainly doesn't do them on purpose like you know we yeah 
So the intention of hurting or not hurting or setting things on fire and not setting things on fire completely whack in this Zuko interpretation. And another thing, they added some intentionality for Zuko during the war meeting. Because in the original war meeting, Zuko is overcome with just the need to be like, no, this is a bad plan, I need to stop it, and he just speaks out of turn without thinking about it. Because it's just it's just coming from his heart, man, and he's just he's just going. Whereas in the live action, it felt so much less impactful to me. And maybe that's a me thing. But he sits there and he like speaks up a little bit and they shut him down. And then he like sits through the rest of the meeting quietly. And then when everyone else is standing up and chatting, he stands up and he's still staring at the board. And then he squares up and he's like, no, this is wrong. And they put a lot of intention and a lot of like Zuko knows that he's standing up to his father right now. He knows that he's talking against what has been said, but he's going to do it anyway. And that's just it. It doesn't feel like a 13 year old who's scared of his father just like blurting out what he actually feels. It feels like a child who really thinks that he could be listened to, which I guess they made Ozai kind of different in this one. Maybe it makes sense. But it felt a lot less impactful to me to have Zuko think about it so hard. You know? Before he went off. Okay, guys. We're finally in the last portion. Ready? Episode choices. So I'm just gonna go and mention big changes by episode, why they sucked or why they didn't, and what could or should have been done to make them actually work. So, episode one. Starting off with the Earth Kingdom dude stealing the false information for an attack on the Earth Kingdom, right? I've heard a lot of complaints about this. I think it's kind of interesting because it sets up the war more and makes it clear that the other nations suspected the Fire Nation was up to something and they were looking out for it. Um, in fact, you know what I would suggest to make everything better is instead of making a live-action adaptation of this show, what would have been far cooler would be a prequel about how the war got started in the first place, perhaps following this random Earth man. Like, maybe everyone thinks he's paranoid and he's determined to uncover the Fire Nation plot. Uh, it would be fun. It would be tragic. It would get people to go back and watch the original cartoon to see how the tragedy resolved. As it is, I kind of, I like the idea, but it's super jarring to be thrown into when we have no idea who this guy is. So it's really, really not very well executed. But yeah, uh, my suggestion would be made to make a prequel with original characters instead of butchering my emotional support cartoon. Next thing, changing the opening. I've seen a lot of people complain my, about this. I don't mind it, especially because it was set 100 years in the past, so, like, Katara wasn't alive. So, like, sure, Kiyoshi gave the intro before the massacre and all that, whatever. But changing the entire opening and then having Gran Gran give the original opening without any sort of changes to make it sound better in a conversational setting is so terrible. And if they wanted the original opening, they should have just kept it there. Please. Appa, not coming out of the iceberg with Aang? I'm confused as to where he was. This happens again later. I'll just mention it now when, like, Sokka and Katara are following the badger moles. And then they just, like, appear to save Aang from Boomy. Like, how did they get there? Like, it, it just, it feels like a really bad, badly thought out, like, I didn't want to show this, so instead, I just had him appear randomly later with no explanation. It just, it was weird. Um, also, the bison whistle makes noise, which is not, like, a deal breaker or anything, but I just... It's like a dog whistle. Like, it, it shouldn't make noise. Do they understand? Did the person who wrote this understand what a dog whistle was? Is that... Guys, just because you can't hear it doesn't mean it's not real. This is the constant problem with this show. 
that this adaptation just doesn't understand that if I didn't hear with my own ears, maybe it could still be true. It's a possibility, I believe. Anyway, um, also in the first episode, Katara asserts that she is the only waterbender, and I quote, in this village. Which implies two things. One, that their village isn't the only one, which is chill. It makes sense that the South is made up of a bunch of different tribes. Uh, but it also implies that there are waterbenders in other villages. Which begs the question, why is Katara not being taught how to bend by them? And even without other benders, just the idea that Kana and Sokka, presumably everyone else in the village, are actively discouraging Kar Katara from learning waterbending to the point that Grand Grand is hiding educational scrolls from her, it's just all, it's so ridiculous. And then in that same conversation, Katara says that the Northern Waterbenders are still fighting, and later, when you find out that the Northern Waterbenders are isolationists and have never helped anyone except themselves, there's no sort of, like, incredulous, like, what do you mean? Nothing. This, this line is dropped and it is never picked up again, and it should have been removed if we weren't going to make a big deal out of it. Also, this, this entire conversation, everything Katara says makes me wonder what on earth they were doing. Um, cause she also says that their dad is hunting down the firebenders, which has a very different vibe than saying that they joined the war. So I'm like, is he just like hunting down the specific group of firebenders that killed Kia or like, are they actively joining the war? I'm confused now about this Hakoda. I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> And I don't know if the writers didn't understand the difference or if they did it deliberately, but like, just don't, don't get a job writing things if you don't understand what words mean, okay? Like, you have, I'm sure you have a different calling. Please, go do it and stop writing things. Also, Aang steals, uh, Aang steals Zuko's book that has all of his notes about previous avatars and stuff. And honestly, it's the, it's the most hilarious thing that I've ever seen. This is the only good choice that they made. Stealing Zuko's diary was hilarious. 10 out of 10. Fantastic choice. All right, episode two. Grand Grand sneaking the water squirrel into Katara's bag. She had it the whole time and she was hiding it. Why? Why did she do this? Like, why would you, why? Anyway, I would have hated anything less than that. Like, literally anything. You could have them literally just walking down a road and some rando is like, hey, you're wearing blue. Are you a waterbender? And Katara goes, why, yes, I am. And this rando is like, I happen to have this priceless scroll. Do you want to learn from it? And I would be like, this makes me less mad than Kana having hidden a scroll from her for forever. That would have been a better choice. Also, they, like, mention the pirates later, and it kind of pisses me off that they mention the pirates and the gang getting in trouble with the pirates later when they removed the reason for them getting in trouble with the pirates. Like, just, just don't mention it. If you're gonna butcher it so badly, just don't mention it. Episode 3. So, the first problem is the episodes that they chose to combine here. As stated early, earlier in the character analysis, placing Jet and the Mechanist in Omashu was absolutely fatal to their characters. And given that we don't see Bumi until the next episode, there's actually no reason why we couldn't have made Jet and the Mechanist take place elsewhere and then go to Omashu the next episode to meet Bumi. There's no reason that didn't happen. Um, in fact, I would say this would be so easy to resolve. Instead of being set in Omashu, we set it in Haru's village. Haru didn't make it into the live action, and you wouldn't have to go into the prison plot because that would be too much. Or even if it wasn't Haru's village, just literally any village outside of the stronghold of Omashu. But listen, you start out with them in the forest, chased by firebenders, and you have Jet save them like in the cartoon. Katara is smitten. Aang thinks he's the coolest. Sokka hates him on sight. At some point, Sokka gets fed up and marches off to get supplies from the village and meets the mechanist who he bonds with immediately, and Haru could be just a fun side character, you know? Or, 
you know, he doesn't have to be there, but he could. He could be just like a random side guy who's like, oh, look, an earthbender. Yay. It doesn't matter. Um, anyway, things proceed from there. Katara yelling at Sokka about spies. Sokka yelling at Katara about terrorists. Both of them realizing that they're both correct. You could even have Jet help drive off the Fire Nation attack that would come from den from denying their weapons. Like, sure, why not? Like, could be fun. It could have been a really interesting combo. But basically, everything would have been better if they were not in Omashu. Also in this episode, we get the Fire Nation people trying to kill Ozai. And, like, I get that this was supposed to show us that there are some people in the Fire Nation who are good, that there are groups of people who want Ozai to, like, get out of power. And that's cool. Like, that's totally fine. But what was the plan that these guys had? Like, if you're going to try to assassinate the leader of your nation, you you need a plan. You need an actual plan. Like, they snuck into the war room. Were they going to challenge Ozai to an Agni Kai? Like, you don't sneak into somewhere to assassinate someone just to attack them in the front of their home, from the front in their home turf. They should have gone to Ozai's room while he was sleeping. Also, in the unlikely event that they had somehow killed Ozai, what was the plan then? Beyond them not surviving, which Ozai pointed out himself, they didn't actually have anyone to fill the power vacuum. They didn't know Princess Azula, obviously, since she was the one in their midst and they didn't recognize her, so they have no reason to believe that she would end the war. If they killed Ozai, she would just take over and... what? They thought that her own people killing her father would make her think the war is bad? Not likely. Also, why did Azula have to go undercover to stop such a shoddy assassination attempt? Like, they wouldn't have even gotten into the palace if she hadn't let them in. And if Azula was doing it for fun, sure, but this Azula, as previously analyzed, is nothing like canon Azula. She saw this as a chore, and even says she was risking her life to weed out these dissenters. But like, why? They weren't even good dissenters. I do have a way that this would work. They could have done this, and it could have been cool. Are you ready? Azula tells people that she disagrees with her father and will fight him for the throne if she has enough support. She'll challenge him to an Agni Kai. This explains why they would burst into the throne room. This explains who they think is going to end the war. And this explains why it necessitated that Princess Azula, instead of any number of random people, couldn't have done it. And in that case, she would have weeded out a lot of high-ranking dissenters, people who thought that their voice behind her would lend itself to taking out Ozai. Like, they could have done a lot of political stuff with Azula pretending to go against her father. But instead, they just had her pose as a servant girl and let in these chumps who clearly had no plan to actually end the war, or even kill Ozai at all. Other things that happen in this episode, um, the Fire Nation spy in Omashu uses firebending in the middle of the street. He just lights it up. He just... What kind of spy does that? It's baffling. I don't know. And also, why... Is Jet's assassination attempt viable? Why, like, why is this bomb threat even a problem? Why is Boomy personally meeting the mechanist in the courtyard and sketchily handing over a briefcase? What was that entire interaction? It didn't need to happen. If it happened inside, the entire threat would be neutralized because they couldn't shoot a flaming arrow into the blasting jelly to explode everyone. It doesn't make any sense that they would have such an important meeting out in the courtyard with King Boomy himself, especially if you want me to believe, as they do next episode, that Boomy is not doing anything to keep this place safe. 
why would he meet personally with the mechanist in that case? It doesn't, it, it's nonsense. All right, episode four. First of all, I'm going to give a quick shout out to the lesbian lovers of Omashu. I was about to blow a gasket when they mentioned that a lady was killed because I was like, ex freaking excuse me, the man died in the war and the lady went and stopped the war and united the, nation, the nations and it was fantastic. How dare you fridge the lady and have the man do her hard work. But then they said another lady ended the war and united the nations and my ire evaporated and was replaced by joy because I am a simple queer and I eat up basic rep for breakfast. So I'm going to shout this out without further discussion. I love the lesbian lovers of Omashu. Okay, next. The episodes they combined for this. The Omashu and the Cave of Two Lovers. At first I was kind of mad because if they aren't even trying to do justice to the stuff we already have in season one, why are we adding a season two episode? But on further reflection, I kind of like it. I like it because the Cave of Two Lovers, right, is the returning to Omashu in the second season episode to ask Bumi to be Aang's earthbending teacher. And the existence of the cave here in the first Omashu occurrence, to me, indicates that we're not going to return to Omashu, and thank goodness for that, because if I ever see this Bumi again, it will be too soon. He shouldn't be teaching anyone anything, and I hope Jet manages to assassinate him. Forget that they say at the end that they're going to get Bumi and show him tied in front of Azula. Ignore that. It never happened. We're not going back there. It's not gonna happen. They already said it, it can't happen, please. Anything but that. Also, I have beef with the mail system because they have this whole thing where, like, right, the gravity brings it down, which makes sense, but then they, like, also slide it up the exact same way, which is so inefficient. Like, in the original, Aang says earthbending brings it up and gravity brings it down, and that makes so sense, so much sense, because earthbenders just go, and the things go, straight up into the air and they land at the top and then gravity brings them back down do you know how much earth bending power how much time and how much unnecessary effort it would be to drag every single one of those things back up the ramps instead of just shooting them back to the top like actually worked in the original like It's like they didn't think about the mechanics of anything. They were just like, yeah, if we were doing this, we'd put it on like a pulley system and then it would go. And I'm like, do you know, do you understand that bending exists? Did you put two seconds into thinking about how bending works? The answer is clearly no, clearly no. Yeah, see my previous section on Boomy as a character for literally every single choice they made this episode and why it was the wrong one. Next, I already know that I... I know that I already mentioned changing the answer of the cave from the crystals to the badger moles, but my god, that was such a terrible decision, and I'm mentioning it again because why would they do that? Why did they do that? This was the worst decision you possibly could have made in this moment. It was horrible. Also, Iroh gets stabbed and Zuko decides not to chase the Avatar. And on my second watch, I was like, wait, is this, is this after Zuko alone? Is that what, like, why is this season two development happening right now? Like, I already know that we're meshing every possible imagined version of Zuko together, but really, why are you throwing in this season two content when you can't even do season one content? It doesn't make any sense, and please stop. Episode five. Aang meditated so hard it pulled them into the spirit world. Sure, why not? Uh, I already talked about Wan Chi Tong's warning about facing the truth, put these, but like, I'm mentioning it again because the flashbacks make so, so, they're so much worse and everything is worse when you add Wan Chi Tong randomly talking about facing the truth before throwing these two children into 
their worst thoughts about themselves. Like, you're just going to look me in the eye and, and tell me that that they're right. Okay, cool, sure, why not? Why not? Okay, um, another big change, Gyatso in the spirit world. I kind of like that they have Gyatso in the spirit world. Just like, as, as a concept, I think it was interesting. I think it would have been really cool to add this into something that was actually anything like the show because it would have been a really interesting way to be like, look, this is Aang. He had to work through all of his grief with Gyatso. His friends helped him. And now, like, he gets to actually talk to Gyatso again. I think that could have been really cool. Except it undermines even further the greater tragedy of the Air Nomad Massacre. Because in the beginning, Aang finds out randomly, you know, from Gran Gran, that all everyone he knows is dead. And he runs off, and we don't even get to see him process it. And then the Air Temple was absolute nonsense he shows up and he flips out and then he has flashbacks to Gyatso and he stops himself and it's like we technically saw him have feelings about the nomad massacre but like really like I didn't believe a second of that it, it was it was so poorly done and then he stumbles across Gyatso you know like we haven't even seen him process the air nomad massacre or anything but he stumbles across Gyatso, and I was already like, okay, well, I guess there was a genocide because they didn't do it well. So I was like, I don't, if I hadn't watched the original show, I would just be kind of like, huh. Which is not nearly a strong enough response. But then Gyatso is also here on top of that. So Aang doesn't even have to deal with it like he did before. Like Gyatso's there. It's fine. Like he can just talk to him. Like, I, I love the idea, but the execution of everything leading up to it was so poor that I didn't feel emotionally impacted as I should have by the fact that Aang hasn't completely lost all connection to his people, you know? I was just like, oh, hey, Gyatso's here. That's nice. Instead of, oh, thank God, now Aang can talk to someone he trusts who was there and we can start working through the survivor's guilt and other complexes that built up over the last hundred years. I was just like, eh. Cool. Gyatso. That's nice. And finally in episode 5, the conclusion of the Heibai plotline, like, where he randomly buries an acorn and says, I know you're in pain. And that apparently just fixes Heibai. Like, as I said in Heibai's thing, they should have just removed the Heibai plotline completely. It would have been much better. Alright, episode 6. There is literally no reason to be on Crescent Island. The inclusion of Roku in the plot when he didn't mention Sozin's comet was ridiculous. Um, June somehow arrived on Sacred Crescent Island with a huge sheer shoe and no one noticed until it was too late. Uh, we're in the Fire Nation for five seconds before June brings them right back out so that Zuko can not get arrested for breaking banishment. So, like, going to Crescent Island and meeting Roku was less than a side quest. It was a blip. And it didn't even make any sense. Um, quick shout out to Zhao's speech starting Sons and Daughters of Fire because at least they didn't do us the discourtesy of trying to remove sexism from the water tribes and putting it in the Fire Nation to prove how evil they are. And finally, the decision to get the crew to be loyal to Zuko by just telling them what he did. In the cartoon, Iroh does tell them, but they only really believe it after Zuko risks his life saving G from falling off the ship. In this, Iroh tells them what happened and that they're the 41st while Zuko is gone. And then he returns and all of a sudden all of his people are like standing in attention and saluting him and calling him their prince. And it's just baffling. And if I was Zuko, I think I would have thought I was going to get assassinated by these people in short order because there's there didn't seem to be any sort of switch there that made any sense if you weren't you know, present for the explanation. It just, it, it makes a lot less sense if Zuko didn't do something to prove that he is how Iroh says he is.
All right, episode seven. Uh, honestly, I think every single plot point in this episode was covered by the sexism overarching themes and the different character analysis, so nothing else to add. Episode eight. Uh, Tween lobbying mortal for the Ice Moon specifically. There's a lot going on with this. Uh, first of all, Zhao didn't find this information in the super secret spirit library. He found it in Roku's temple. Like... A fire sage just was like, oh, by the way, did you know this super crazy fun fact? This is like common knowledge. It's common knowledge for the fire sages in the Fire Nation. So do the waterbenders know? And then Yue talks about it later and confirms that, yeah, Yue knew that, that, that they'd be here. And I'm like, why aren't the waterbenders protecting that their spirits, their spirits that they know are vulnerable today? Or if they didn't think they are vulnerable, seeing as in this they can only be killed by Kuruk's blade, which fair, it really seems like something that you would celebrate or like a big deal that the celebration is canceled because of the invasion, like... I just feel like the Water Tribe should have cared more that their spirits are suddenly in corporeal form for one night of the year. And they clearly knew that this was a thing that happened, and it just, like, they didn't think it was important, I guess? Who knows? Also, everyone being like, Aang can never come back from being possessed by the Water Spirit. Like, why? 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 Like, five people say it. There is no Avatar anymore. And I'm like, but why? What? It doesn't make any sense. It It's weird. And he does come back in the, at the end of the episode. So, like, it's completely baseless. I feel like they wanted to add more drama about him being taken, but then just, like, fumbled it like they did everything else. Although... I will say, I think the reason that they wanted to add more drama about him maybe never returning from being a spirit is because they removed the horror of him turning into the spirit in the first place. Let me explain. Because in the cartoon, Aang does, like... I don't even know if he offers himself to the ocean spirit. I think Avatarness just takes over him and he just goes. Whereas in this, Aang was like, heck yeah, let's just get this super powerful spirit to solve all my problems for me. <laughs> and afterwards, this Aang looks back into the city and sees all the carnage. And he's like, this is my fault. It's because I'm not a better avatar. And he's only looking in the city. And he's talking about the Fire Nation getting away with destroying the city. This Aang doesn't care that he quite possibly murdered an entire fleet of Fire Nation soldiers. In the cartoon, it wasn't the destruction of the city that really got to Aang. Like, obviously, he didn't want the city to be destroyed. He felt bad about it getting destroyed. But he was more focused on the fact that he personally, even possessed by, like, a spirit, probably killed hundreds of firebenders. And he didn't care that they were firebenders, you know? Like, they were people, because that's what Aang is like. But this Aang, this live-action Aang, was like, screw them firebenders. They attacked the North. Who cares about them? But I'm really sad that I couldn't have stopped them further. I couldn't have stopped them earlier. And I'm just like, this Aang is not the avatar that the Fire Nation needs, you know? Like, he's the avatar, sure, that the other nations need. He could stop the war. The real thing about Aang being the avatar of all nations is that he cares about what happens to the Fire Nation just as much as he cares about what happens to all the other nations, even though the Fire Nation instigated the problem. We can trust Aang that after the war, he will treat the Fire Nation as worthy of life. And he won't just, like, take it out of their hides and give everything to the other nations. 
this Aang, this live action Aang, I don't believe that he is the Fire Nation's avatar. I believe that he is totally doing everything he can for the Earth and Water Nations. And if after the war, the Earth and Water Nations wanted to destroy the Fire Nation and take all of their infrastructure and take all of their crap, I believe he'd let it happen because I don't think this Aang sees firebenders as people. Because that's the only explanation as to why he didn't even flinch at killing a whole ton of them as the water spirit. Bad Aang. Terrible Aang. Um, and also, as a final note, we didn't mention Sozin's Comet until right here at the very end, all of a sudden, Ozai is looming over a table and there's like a comet and they light it on fire. And I'm just like, why are we talking about the comet now? Like, the reason the comet's important is because it's a deadline and Aang doesn't even know about that deadline and I don't feel nervous about it. Like, this isn't, this isn't like a different thing where it's like, oh no, I as the audience know that there's a deadline and he doesn't know. Which happens in season three, by the way, because even though they know about the comet, they don't know what they're planning on doing with the comet, right? But that isn't this. This is just like... Weird we aren't giving the protagonists any reason to be doing anything and it's it's dumb the the inclusion of sozin's comet right here at the end i feel was supposed to make me be like <gasps> sozin's comet but instead it was like why are you mentioning that now it has nothing to do with anything roku should have brought this up weeks ago and because he didn't it doesn't matter anymore because ang is just going to go ahead and do it on this timeline anyway, I guess. He doesn't need any impetus to do whatever he needs. Uh, yeah, so that's the end of the episode by episode thing. And finally, I actually do have one more thing to add, um, because I do in fact have a solution to this. My real quick plug here at the end is that there is a way to make good adaptations, and I'm going to tell you that what you need to do is choose to adapt one of the top 10 canon rewrites on AO3. I'm serious about this. I don't know what they are off the top of my head, but what you need to do is you need to have someone who loves Avatar The Last Airbender or whatever thing you're, ad you're, you're adapting. Have someone who loves it. And you know what? Those people who are writing canon rewrites for no money sometimes like over 300,000 words, they love it. They know it. They are doing it justice. And the more kudos they get, you know, the fandom loves it. A plus. One foolproof way to get rewrites that are interesting and different, are made by someone who actually loves the work and knows what's going on with it and are generally vetted by the community and are like yeah this is good this is quality so yeah next time don't hire some rando to write this thing go and track down a fan fiction author who has popular works and just pay them for it do it I dare you. I want someone to do this so bad, I think it would turn out way better than any other adaptation anyone has ever made. And I just I just want someone to do it to prove that. I don't have the money for it. I don't have the inclination. But next time someone wants to make a freaking live action of something that doesn't need one, at least try this. At least try getting someone who actually cares and loves the series and everyone in the fandom agrees is good at it. AO3, top kudod fix. Canon rewrite. There you go. That's the secret. The other option you can do is go like a full meme about it. Um, that being said, me and the Stellacore peeps are thinking of writing an Avatar retelling that's actually just a play that the Ember Island players are putting on after the war, so it's like, really? 
really bad. Um, so like, if you're interested in that, feel free to comment and that'll motivate me to actually write the script faster and get on with the production. But yeah, actually make it good or make it just as bad as, as you think it could be and have that be your vision. And that's the answer to how to make an adaptation. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk.